Next on C-SPAN, a hearing on cable television programming diversity held before the House Energy and Commerce Telecommunications Subcommittee, chaired by Representative Edward Markey of Massachusetts. Good morning. Today, the Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance will hold the second of three scheduled hearings concerning oversight of the cable television industry. Today, we will focus on increasing viewer and consumer choices in the video marketplace, or what are the syndex and must carry rules, and why should anybody care? Or, to put it another way, who is the real last emperor? Ted Turner, John Malone, Ralph Baruch, or Jack Valenti? Which of them uh, really does have the clout in the <coughs> new world of telecommunications? We will attempt to determine the impact, if any, of the Cable Communications Policy Act of 1984 on competition between and among the various electronic media. And some we will attempt to review what, if any, have been the successes of cable deregulation and what, if any, have been the excesses of cable deregulation. We will analyze the competitive balance between broadcasters, cable operators, and program suppliers. But it is my hope and intention that this hearing not simply turn into a sterile discussion and recitation of the economic interests of competitive industries. Rather, I hope we can focus on what these issues mean to the public. For example, what would be the impact on the home viewer if the syndex rules are reimposed? Would the consumer face a dizzying array of blacked out channels or pasted together replacement programming as suggested by many in the cable industry? Or would reimposition of the syndex rules provide the consumer a greater diversity of programming while simultaneously helping to preserve our system of local broad broad broadcasting? Similarly, what will the video world look like if the Congress or the FCC do not develop and implement constitutionally supportable must-carry rules? Will cable operators begin to drop all programming in which they do not have an economic interest or on which they can not sell commercial time? Or will cable continue to carry local broadcasters, network and independent and public alike, because of the unique role local broadcasters <coughs> serve in our communities? Turning to another issue, what is the truth about the level of concentration of ownership in the cable industry? And how does it or could it affect the consumer? Are horizontal and vertical integration in cable neutral consequences of the maturation of the industry? Or is cable now or does it threaten to become the natural monopoly about which we have heard so much? I am certain that there will be interest in discussing the scrambling <coughs> or dish issue. Although in Malden, Massachusetts, where I come from, when we talk about scrambling and dish, we're talking about ham and eggs on Sunday morning. So these issues have enormous importance uh, depending upon the perspective uh, of the uh, individual which is viewing them. And if we look at the flap, over channel shifting, we have to ask if moving a broadcast station to Video Siberia, also known as Channel 88 on your local cable system, has a real impact on the viewer in this era of remote control, clutching couch, couch potatoes. <coughs> the importance of this <coughs> hearing today is that we will have an opportunity to discuss how we can provide the American public the greatest number of viewing options at the most reasonable cost. And we will discuss what policy options will best effectuate that goal. But the reality and the beauty of the telecommunications industries is that just when you think that you've got it all figured out, the technology advances. In the 70s, satellites emerged and pushed the cable and broadcasting industries into new directions and sparked incredible growth. It appears that high-definition television and other advanced television technologies will similarly affect the development of these industries for the next decade and beyond. I doubt that we will reach an accord today on any of the issues that we will discuss. But I do expect that the distinguished panels we hear from today will endeavor to enlighten the subcommittee and to provide us a clearer, maybe even highly defined view 
of the status of competition in the video marketplace. The time of the chair has expired. The chair now recognizes the ranking minority member, the gentleman <coughs> from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo, for an opening <coughs> statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to begin by certainly welcoming all the witnesses to the second of our three hearings on the cable television industry. I hope that this hearing, and I'm sure it will be as comprehensive and informative <coughs> as our first hearing this past March. Today we will hear testimony on import important issues affecting the relationships between cable, broadcasters, and program producers, including must-carry, syndicated exclusivity, channel shifting, and vertical integration in the cable industry. These issues have the potential to profoundly affect the relationships among mass media conduits and programmers. For a variety of reasons, some of these issues now seem to be near resolution. <coughs> I believe the way these issues are decided by the courts, by Congress, by the FCC, and by the affected industries may later be seen as a crossroads in the regulation of mass media in this nation. For example, today we will consider whether rules which require cable systems to carry local broadcast stations, must carry rules, should be reimposed legislatively. Without must carry, broadcasters contend that the future of off-air television will, will be jeopardized. Therefore, how Congress attempts to craft workable must carry rules is of great significance. One thing we know for sure, it's a difficult task for many, many reasons. When must carry rules were first imposed on cable in the mid-60s, cable was explicitly regulated as auxiliary to broadcasting since there was little else to carry but broadcast TV stations. Now, however, there are numerous complicating factors, including the 1984 Cable Act, which changed in many respects the regulatory treatment of cable TV systems. Moreover, the present harm to broadcasters must be well documented if new must-carry rules are to be sustained in court. This hearing, together with the FCC report, which is due on September 1st, should shed considerable light on that subject. Also, when must-carry rules were first imposed, the public interest standard for broadcasters was firmly established. However, the standard may now be in flux. In fact, some say that with the demise of the fairness doctrine, the public interest standard is either meaningless or is effectively repealed. I do not believe the public interest standard is dead, neither do broadcasters. However, FCC deregulation, the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine, and court decisions twice eliminating must-carry rules have all combined to create considerable uncertainty about whether any must-carry rules may be imposed on cable in the name of broadcasting's public <coughs> interest standard or local service obligation. For all of these reasons, the debate on must-carry will certainly be illuminating for the regulatory future of broadcasting as well as for cable. Two public policy objectives apparently are set to collide. The special status of broadcasting and the relatively unfettered First Amendment status of cable operators. No one knows for sure what that result will be. Another important issue may be decided this month. The issue of syndicated exclusivity or syndex. The FCC is considering reimposing Syndex rules that will give broadcasters the right to bargain for exclusive rights to programming. It is argued that Syndex will lead to massive blackouts of programming and to the demise of superstations like WTBS. However, there are two sides to that argument. Broadcasters claim that without Syndex, they lose ratings and advertising to distant signals. Since cable systems and other delivery systems can maintain program exclusivity, it has been difficult for cable to argue that broadcasters should be denied similar rights to acquire programming on an exclusive basis should they choose to do so. Apparently, the FCC will impose syndicated exclusivity rules. Broadcasters applaud that decision. The cable industry appears to be reconciled to it. Therefore, the difficult problem with syndicated exclusivity is not whether it will be reimposed, but how it will be reimposed. When the FCC reimposes syndicated exclusivity, I hope that it will craft rules that give the industry a reasonable time to adjust to the changed atmosphere 
and do not result in massive disruptions of service for millions of consumers who have grown used to the operation of cable systems free of syndex. Although I am a strong supporter of must carry, I do not prejudge the outcome of the must carry or syndicated <laughs> exclusivity questions, nor do I prejudge how the other issues will, which will be brought up today will be decided, like channel shifting and vertical integration. Our purpose here today is to gain a deeper understanding into the marketplace and the regulatory forces which are responsible for the rapid growth of cable television, both as a delivery mechanism and as a programmer in its own right. Cable has come a long way in a very short time. In the past decade, it has evolved from a passive carrier to an emerging power in television programming. If I may coin a phrase, with that power comes the responsibility to peacefully coexist with other delivery technologies like broadcasting. I believe that cable must adopt a course that does not attempt to maximize its strengths at the expense of broadcasting and of program producers. In that regard, I'm encouraged by cable's willingness to address the concerns of Congress and of broadcasters on issues like must carry and syndex. I hope that cooperation continues only then can the greatest benefits of competition be obtained, increasing the amount of quality programming available in the home. That was Congress's goal when we passed the Communications Act. It was our goal in 1984 when we passed the Cables Act, Cable Act, and I certainly hope it remains our goal today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to the <coughs> testimony of today's very distinguished witnesses. I thank the gentleman very much. Um, The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sinar. Mr. Chairman, I don't have an opening statement, and I just look forward to the testimony today. I would ask unanimous consent that I enter into the record uh, some testimony from United Video uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Without objection, it will be included on the record. The chair recognizes a uh, gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Coates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have a formal statement either. I gave one at the last hearing on cable. I just want to say that uh, with the dramatic changes that have been taking place in this industry in the past uh, 10 or 12 years or so, uh, have come dramatic new opportunities for viewers across the country. I think it's exciting. Obviously, it brings uh, problems. It brings many questions. Uh, we've got the real heavyweights here this morning. Hopefully, we can have uh, the kind of give and take that's necessary for us to uh, get the sufficient information to find out just what our role should be. Uh, determine, help determine what the role of the FCC should be, what the role of the marketplace should be in sorting all these questions out. I have a number of specific questions re related to syndicated exclusivity, must carry, a number of other issues. I, the chairman has detailed those issues that are before us. I'm happy to see the uh, real heavyweights of the uh, industry here this morning, and I hope that they feel free to uh, lay it all out on the table and get a good free flow of information back and forth so that we can get a better grasp of where we are with a lot of serious questions that have to be answered. Thank you for calling. I thank the gentleman. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Eckert. Well, Mr. Chairman, I would just simply say that it wasn't but a few years ago that the cable industry was walking around these halls uh, uh, describing themselves as a hat in hand, give me a break industry. And Congress did that. And uh, it would be my simple observation, which I hope will be developed in the course of the testimony and the questions, that uh, that 85 Act wouldn't pass today, uh, given the level of, of constituent comment and uh, industry strife that, uh, uh, that exists today. Uh, I think a lot of us have learned an important lesson that Pan Am competition is really good. Uh, maybe Eastern doesn't like it, but it certainly has shown the, that there is tremendous value that accrues when consumers have choices. <coughs> And it's just this gentleman's observation, again, which we hopefully will develop in, in the questions, that when monopolies exist, prices go up and service goes down. And for my constituents and those who suffer uh, under that, and for those who must label in that, uh, labor in that marketplace, uh, that uh, we find that uh, currently an unconscionable set of circumstances. And I thank the chairman for convening this hearing, and I think it should be a productive part of, of the record as, uh, as we see the need to uh, move forward. Great. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from <coughs> Pennsylvania, Mr. Ritter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I also welcome the heavyweights at the witness table. But I would like to add that there is one heavyweight which is not at the witness table, which uh, surrounds this uh, hearing room, and that is 
the onslaught of advancing technology, which can uh, change uh, the situation quite uh, rapidly. Uh, once cable was the principal alternative to broadcasting, and, uh, now technology is racing ahead with new alternatives like wireless cable or VCRs or satellite dish delivery. And with the advent of high definition television and its <coughs> eventual optimal delivery system, um, there will be increasing distinctiveness amongst the uh, delivery systems. So with all these policies, uh, it's imperative, with all these possibilities, it's imperative that we craft policies that make the overall system work for American consumers. Uh, telecommunications has got to be one of the most crucial industries of the 20th century. And uh, we do have the available technology. Will we have the collective intelligence to make the system work uh, appropriately and properly? And as I look at the uh, witness table, there are competitors, but there's a tremendous uh, um, potential for working together. After all, the, the products of Mr. Valenti's industry are still the prime time products of the cable industry uh, the cable industry uses. So uh, I look forward to these hearings, Mr. Chairman. It's an exciting uh, uh, initiation to uh, the dialogue between the heavyweights. Thank Great. you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Bryant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, again want to join in the others in uh, commending you for calling this hearing today on these very complicated issues. I've made my opinion uh, widely known in the recent uh, weeks here that uh, we need to uh, incorporate a must-carry provision uh, into our laws, and I've suggested that we tie must-carry to the cable compulsory license as a means to do that constitutionally. And also my strong conviction that we need to be uh, hard on the side of syndicated exclusivity, on the side of permitting uh, scrambling as long as people are able to get a box and pay a reasonable price for it, because I think we're going to have to uh, which will not be produced unless there's a market to buy it, and people won't buy it unless they're guaranteed the exclusive right of it, or at least the exclusive right of it in a region, in a particular region of the country. I hope the members of the panel today will address uh, those issues and also address the issue that's pending today, this time, in fact, may be considered for markup again tomorrow in the copyright subcommittee of the uh, Judiciary Committee regarding the proposal to extend the compulsory license to the satellite disk, dish, satellite disk programming uh, distributors. Uh, I think that's uh, something that this committee ought to pay careful attention to. I think it is appropriately in our jurisdiction here. And uh, I hope that the members of the panels today will talk about it. And finally, uh, I think uh, some mention would be valuable from the witnesses with regard to proposals to allow the telephone companies to get involved in the cable business, cable television business. Uh, I'm sure some comment will be made about that from those that represent the cable industry, but it might be valuable to hear from the others as well. I appreciate you uh, calling this Great. meeting. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fields. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be extremely brief. Uh, most of us on this panel have dealt with these complicated issues for many years and realize that we're dealing with some very complex industries. And I just hope that in this hearing that our focus will stay on the consumer <coughs> and our goal should be to effectuate uh, policies that benefit the consumers. And as long as our focus stays on the consumer, then we're going to come up with good policy. And I just want to commend you for calling these hearings. I'm sure we'll learn a lot. Uh, particularly as we deal with this emerging uh, industry. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. I know. No, okay, then I think that concludes uh, the period for opening statements from members of the committee. I have a statement here from uh, James Quello, who is a commissioner on the Federal Communications Commission. He has requested his statement to be included uh, in the record, and without objection, we will include it at the appropriate point in the record. Uh, we now turn to our uh, first panel. Uh, that panel consists of uh, Mr. Ted Turner, who is President and Chief Executive Officer of Turner Broadcasting System Incorporated, uh, Mr. John Malone, who is President and Chief Executive Officer of 
Telecommunications Incorporated, uh, Mr. Ralph Baruch, who is chairman of the National Academy of Cable Programming, and Mr. Jack Valenti, who is president of the Motion Picture Association of America. Um, we welcome you all. Um, we ask as best possible that each of you try to present your opening uh, comments in as concise a uh, form as possible. Uh, there will be ample opportunity uh, to elaborate on any of the key points which you wish to uh, introduce in your opening statements. Um, and I'd like to ask you, Mr. Valenti, if you would uh, please uh, offer us your uh, opening statement first, and then we will go down the uh, panel uh, in reverse order from uh, that I initially introduced you. So whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Mr. Chairman, members of this committee... Could you move the microphone just a little bit closer? In my formal written testimony, as I hope you've read, I began with... Uh, their neighbors in uh, pre-Christian Britain with an iron hand. The instrument of their power uh, was the Druids. With whom they contested. And so it was that the ownership of the Druids egg is the fo first known outcropping of a zest for monopoly <laughs> in a non-competitive environment. Now, the, uh, the latter-day progeny of the Druids are the great cable combines who, uh, <laughs> who guard with sleepless vigilance uh, their own Druids egg, which is, of course, their monopoly funnel uh, to the cable homes in their community. Now, I, I think the time has come for this committee to rise up and break the Druid's egg and restore to the marketplace what Congress intended all the while, which was a competitive arena. Now, I, I want to say first that uh, uh, I have great affection for and respect uh, for each of the gentlemen at this table, Ted Turner and Ralph Baruch, are my old, old valued friends, and I hope uh, John Malone is my new friend. Uh, I can... Uh, <laughs> I paid Dr. Malone the highest compliment I can by saying I wished I was a stockholder in his company. <laughs> and because I follow the, uh, uh, the theory of the late Robert Kerr, senator from Oklahoma, who once said, I'm against all monopolies that I'm not a part of. <laughs> <laughs> there are four questions that this committee has got to answer. In my judgment, questions which pierce the heart of the hunger of consumers for competition. The first question is, is it in the public interest that only one corporation, only one company, control all the television material that flows into the cable homes of a community? Is it in the public interest that a single corporate authority not only owns the cable system and has a virtual complete lock on all the channels and wields the power over what programs are shown and not shown, but now takes an increasing ownership stake in the programs that they exhibit. Question number three, is it in the public interest for an industry with a total net value of $67 billion, almost twice as much as the entire U.S. broadcasting industry, and more than several times the combined U.S. film and television production industry, could to continue through grants of special privileges by the Congress to have those grants which come at the direct expense of the consumer? what Mr. Fields wanted to point to, and I want to, the consumer. And four, is it in the public interest for one, two, three, or four giant mega monopolies to control the most pervasive, powerful, influential, social, and political force this nation has ever known, the television screen? Now, I think unless all reason has departed and all responsibility abandoned, the answer to those questions is no. And if that is so, then... Is it not in the public interest for this committee to write what is so clearly and perilously wrong? Now, you gentlemen are the custodians of the nation's television. And as such, I offer you one marketplace truth which has endured through all the ages, and it is this. Competition is always good for consumers, Eastern versus Pan Am. Lack of competition is always bad for consumers, and whoever ignores that truth puts to hazard the future fairness of this country. We all know that. No one industry, no single entity, 
no group of enterprises ought to be allowed by special grants of congressional privilege to dominate the marketplace and thereby unfairly contend with those who want to compete with them. The losers in that ungainly arrangement are consumers, always, every time, every time. Now, I know there are crowds of outrage, cries of outrage and frustration that are coming to you. You know that. Uh, from your constituents who are sick and tired of poor cable service, who are angry when cable phones don't answer and cable owners don't care, who are vexed by unredeemed pledges of cable to bring them new and innovative programming not available on local TV stations, instead of duplicating over and over again programs that are already there. Now, I think they're also frustrated by the lack of a competing entry into their home so they don't have to be held hostage by their local cable system with no alternatives. Today, the constituents in your district who are subscribers uh, have two choices that they don't like their cable system. They can either commit suicide or they can go bowling. <laughs> but they can't choose another cable system. There isn't any. Now, your own colleagues are disillusioned. They're offering bills and holding hearings and aggravated by cable's presumption and disenchanted by cable's power. And the courts are stirring this widespread litigation as your constituents, subscribers, local governments, uh, potential competitors are going to court asserting their rights and then being baffled by cable's entrenchment. The attorney generals of five states have banded together to investigate cable's anti-competitive activity. Now, why this tumult? Because cable is no longer a babe in swaddling clothes. No one need ask, upon what meat doth this babe feed? Because this babe has grown into a giant while its petty competitors, if I may paraphrase a famous playwright, walk under its huge legs and peep about in anti-competitive disarray. Now, in my written testimony, there's an avalanche of evidence that I think proves without a doubt that whatever was believed and legislated some years ago is no longer true. It's remnants of the Ice Age. And I think the gathering of cable power has got to be dispersed, else the consumer, the people that you have by solemn oath sworn to serve, get it where consumers always get it when monopolies assemble, and that is in the neck. Now, I've spoken uh, for six minutes, and that's my time is up. And if you ask me later what I would recommend, I would be overjoyed to tell you. <laughs> Now, I want to let my friends here pull off what I think is the magical hat trick of the year, and that is to try to persuade you that they're not monopolists. Now, if they can do that, I want each of them to know that they will get a free copy of Joan Quigley's book on astrology. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and gentlemen, but I will be here for the rest of the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Valenti, very, very much. Um, our second witness, uh, Mr. Ralph Baruch, once again, is chairman of the National Academy of Cable Programming. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our um, Mr. Baruch. May I request that my written statement be mar made part of the record, please? All, uh, all of the um, written statements of the witnesses, uh, without objection, will be included in the record in their entirety. Thank you very much. I'm also a senior fellow at the Gannett Center for Media Studies, and prior to that was chairman a president and chief executive of Viacom International, which owns cable systems numbering about um, one million. They also operate a number of pay and basic cable channels, such as Showtime, Movie Channel, MTV, uh, Nickelodeon, VH1, and others. They're involved in program production distribution and also own a number of radio and television stations. Prior to that, I spent 17 years at CBS, uh, progressing from a sales executive to group president. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it is no accident that today we see 50, more than 50 basic cable networks and more than a dozen pay networks in existence. Uh, these, I want to show that these services were brought about by the cable television industry, particularly those organizations which own multiple systems. Uh, as we all know, in the early years, the cable television industry was a reception service. <coughs> And I well recall that in the early 70s, our organization met, and it became pretty evident that the reception service could not support 
a cable industry alone and that other services had to be found and that the only one possibly to be worked out at that time of the blue sky services was pay television which was severely handicapped by restrictions put upon it by the FCC. A committee was formed which I had the honor of co-chairing and finally the cable industry prevailed in the courts and these restrictions were uh, uh, were overturned by the courts. And it was in the mid-70s that a organization which owns a large number of cable systems, namely ATC, owned by Time Inc., launched Home Box Office, now known as MH, uh, HBO. This was a MSO that started the service and suffered, I'm sure, for many years, many millions of dollars of losses uh, for startup costs. Uh, shortly thereafter, Viacom started its service called Showtime, and I know that in the first year or two we desperately tried <coughs> to survive because we had difficulty supporting at that time the losses which Viacom was uh, bearing on trying to get this service off the ground. Uh, now Mr. Belenti talked before about uh, competition, and I'm glad he started out uh, with a fable, because that's exactly what it was, there is today competition. The uh, competition between the services is very intense. Uh, now, I recall going around at that time when Showtime started to all the other organizations, including some of Mr. Valenti's clients, uh, trying to obtain financing and selling a piece of equity in Showtime to start off and help us bear some of these losses. I can tell you from my own experience that neither at the broadcast networks, and I met at the top levels, nor uh, Mr. Valenti's clients were standing in line trying to help us defray some of these enormous startup costs and the early losses uh, which we had to bear. Uh, no one else was willing to come up. Then finally we obtained a partner called Teleprompter and we sold half of Showtime to Teleprompter for six million dollars and when Westinghouse bought out, uh, was sold out teleprompter, uh, bought teleprompter rather, uh, their interest veined in a pay service and so we bought it back several years later and had to pay $60 million to buy that half back. Uh, the next one that pioneered was of course WTBS, which was supported and financially and otherwise by the cable television industry system operators. And that's how that came about. Warner. Cable pioneered in its system called Cube in Columbus, Nickelodeon and MTV. And I know the losses that both of these services suffered for a decade, a decade approximately, and I didn't see anyone else trying to fight their way into the line to try and help that organization support some of these losses. Uh, another point was C-SPAN. Uh, I'm very proud to have played a part in the founding of C-SPAN uh, some years ago, which the cable industry still today pays for every week, every month, and every year. And we had to compete with the broadcast industry at that time, which wanted to control C-SPAN. As a matter of fact, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I would like to remind uh, the committee here of a letter that I received from the Speaker of the House on March 19, 1979, complimenting me on the startup as the cable industry did, the startup of C-SPAN. Uh, Viacom at that time began another service called the Cable Health Network. The Cable Health Network in the first few years suffered such losses that we did not see our way clear to be able to support these in longer term, even in our own cable systems. And so we changed the format. We found two other partners, Hearst and ABC. Again, not one of Mr. Valenti's clients was interested in helping us support that service. Uh, the only time that I recall the motion picture company in the early years being interested in pay cable is when they formed a cartel and six companies got together and formed something called Premier, which the courts at the request of the Justice Department ruled illegal. Um, today there are only two services which Mr. Valenti's clients participate in. Uh, out of the number of motion picture companies. One service is USA, uh, and the other one is a pay service called Disney. Uh, I didn't see uh, many others. 
The same losses that Viacom experienced, I'm sure, with some of its cable services uh, were experienced, I'm sure, with CNN. And I just hope that NBC, which just entered the cable programming business, uh, will make out all right because I would like to read an uh, editorial from the May 9th uh, issue of a foremost trade, organ a trade paper, which reads, if I may quote, the risk of plunging into cable, even for those with deep pockets, is easy to do demonstrate. Even the well-financed likes of ESPN had to wait years before striking black ink. NBC must not only endure some of the pain and suffering that cable pioneers already have experienced, it must compete as a cable newcomer with some of the battle-hardened veterans who have survived. I think, Mr. Chairman, the cable television program industry has done a magnificent job in providing the American consumer with a wide variety of services, such as black entertainment television, the Learning Channel, which is helping high school dropouts, Spanish language programming uh, through SIN, country music, uh, arts and entertainment channel, bringing culture and other events to cable subscribers. The industry today is spending about two and a half billion dollars to bring programming to the American public, and that's gonna go up much more in the years to come and I think in the program field is performing a very valuable service. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Baruch, very, very much. Um, our next witness, Mr. John Malone, is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Telecommunications Incorporated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I'm not a public speaker. I, I wish we could afford to hire Mr. Valenti. Maybe he'd like uh, some options in our company. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, uh, with respect to the Cable Act, I think from a consumer point of view, it, it's been an outstanding success. There's been a massive expansion of programming options to the public. I know in our systems, we've added an average of seven new channels to our systems since uh, 1987. Uh, overall, the cable industry has been very responsible in terms of their newfound freedom on rates. In our case, uh, our average uh, bill has gone up about 6% a year since the bill was enacted, despite the fact that our underlying basic programming costs have been accelerating at about 35% a year. Um, with respect to uh, broadcast carriage, I think the industry has behaved quite responsibly. There was an initial uh, surge of concern because all these new channels had to be put somewhere and there was some movement channel shifting. I think you'll find that that was a one-time uh, occurrence. Um, the best proof of the pudding is, in my mind as a businessman, is the reaction of the consumer with his wallet. We basically have had the greatest internal growth in our history since the enactment of the Cable Act. Penetration has surged as consumers have reacted to the increased diversity of programming <coughs> available. And finally, as another measure of consumer satisfaction, we do a, uh, we commission a study of our systems annually by an independent polling agency to determine what the level of satisfaction is. <coughs> this year, and the one just completed, 81% 80 per of our subscribers uh, regarded themselves as highly satisfied or satisfied overall with cable service, the highest we've ever scored in that rating. I might point out that we added another little question in there this year out of interest, which was their degree of satisfaction with the way that the federal government is being run, and, and the federal government drew a 26% favorable uh, rating from those same uh, consumers. Clearly, with technological change and, and uh, the sudden surge in cable, the industry has had an impact on other industries. I'd like to go through those quickly. The first industry is the broadcast industry. As I said, I think we've all behaved pretty uh, soundly in terms of how we've uh, carried broadcast. Philosophically, TCI really does not have any difference with the broadcast industry, either uh, network or independent stations. They are a very important, critically important source of programming for our systems. Uh, we strongly support the theory of localism in programming, and uh, we really don't have any, any issues with them. A survey that Mr. Padden uh, conducted on our behalf uh, 
indicated to us that uh, there were 16 complaints by broadcasters out of roughly 8,000 channel assignment decisions that we made in 1987. Twelve of the 16 related to the desire by UHF stations to be carried in the VHF band, i.e. an improvement of their position. We don't uh, really have a strong philosophical position on that. I think that's a matter of public policy and the competition between various commercial interests. If a regulatory uh, uh, agency would give us uh, some guidance on that, we would follow it because our economic interests are not substantially affected by favoritism to local independent broadcasters vis-a-vis -vis favoritism to uh, uh, cable programmers. I know Mr. Turner doesn't agree with that, but from our perspective, uh, we think that's a legitimate public policy issue. Should cable give channel assignment preference to a UHF independent in its local market? The other four, I say 12, there were 16 complaints, 12 had to do with channel assignment, uh, four had to do with other issues, all of which have been resolved uh, satisfactorily, I believe, to the broadcasters affected. There is no broadcaster in this country that could be carried or would be carried under the must carry rules as proposed that is not currently being carried on TCI systems. Uh, despite that, we believe that the broadcasters are entitled to the codification of the must-carry rules in regulation or in law, and we would support such an action. Um, and I, I think for the very practical reason that they have to finance their businesses and they need that long-term assurance so that they can go forward and, uh, and run their businesses with a high degree of predictability. And I sympathize with, with them in that regard. Um, with respect to uh, to the MPAA, I, I thought we were on good relations until I heard Jack's speech. I'm a little nonplussed by the vitriol. Um, uh, you know, uh, my view of MPAA is that it's essentially the communication industry's uh, answer to OPEC, and I don't, <laughs> I don't envy Jack's uh, job in terms of trying to keep together. Uh, uh, an industry with so many incestuous and disparate uh, perspectives. Uh, it's a little bit, I think, like the way uh, uh, Brezhnev kept the Soviet bloc together by throwing rocks at the U.S. It's, it's a common enemy, so you don't have to focus on your internal disputes. Uh, I don't know where MPA is coming from. Uh, two of the members own USA Network, which has had broad and heavy cable industry support from day one. The Disney Channel has almost universal support in the industry. Very popular, by the way. Uh, Warner, which founded uh, some of the finest cable, original cable programming in the industry, found it expedient to sell their interest and actually took, I think, well in excess of a billion dollars out of the industry by selling uh, their access, in effect, to our systems. And I can also tell you that in private conversations with various uh, MPA member heads, their concern is primarily that we not go out and stimulate too many channels and create too much competition, thereby diluting the advertising revenue streams that they might enjoy on the channels that they might individually own. So I get a little nervous when, uh, when Jack comes forth and protects the public interest. As far as vertical integration goes, TCI is not a programming company. We don't have any pretense to be a programming company. All of our taste, as my mother used to say, is in our mouth. Uh, first of all, in terms of vertical, without the leadership, frankly, of Viacom and Time Inc. in programming, the cable industry would still be in the dark ages. I can't find any record of having been called and su had suggested to me by the Hollywood crowd uh, any of the programming services which were initiated by those companies. <coughs> as far as our own investment interest, we have two. One has been putting our money and our carriage behind those new ideas and those services which our polls indicate our consumers want, but which the economic realities say that no commercial enterprise in programming would come forth and do. Okay? 
black entertainment television lost money for seven years we're proud to have been a founding shareholder and i don't really think this congress wants us to divest of that sixteen and two-thirds interest okay. we provide half the money and we own sixteen and two-thirds percent of the equity am i running off could you just yeah could you just okay. wrap it up let me wrap it up real fast to say the other issue uh... programming issue that we have is that we did bail ted out when he overextended himself trying to acquire programming so he could be certain that he could survive the, the syndicated exclusivity of the must carry rules we're proud we were able to do that we have a passive uh... interest Ted is in hard control of the company and we think by doing that we preserved his creative genius and his vision that brought us cnn that keeps it one of the finest services we have and we keep open the possibility that his genius can produce additional uh, eggs for us that will produce additional progeny. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Mr. Malone, very, very much. And our uh, final witness uh, on this panel, Mr. Ted Turner, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Turner Broadcasting System based in Atlanta. Well, Thank you, Mr. Again. Chairman. Members of the panel, I have a rather lengthy uh, testimony written that has been uh, been submitted, and I'll just uh, hit a couple of high spots uh, during the, the five or so minutes because, and, and, and even so, it's just impossible to cover all the issues that were mentioned by, by the uh, congressman this morning. It's just so complicated. But suffice it to say that uh, I've been in this business now for over 18 years, and I think our record, uh, public service, uh, news, documentaries, uh, is without, without peer. We don't run any of these violent children's programs on, on WTBS, and we never even made requests for the rules, the leapfrogging rules, or, or dropping the blackouts years ago. Uh, we, we didn't lobby for that. It was done by the FCC and by the Congress. And, and we played under the rules that were set up here and created uh, in WTBS the, the second uh, satellite <coughs> delivered service uh, to the cable industry. And it has grown and prospered uh, in spite of many limitations that were put upon us by the, uh, by the MPAA and its, its member companies in not selling us the first run programs because we were a we're adapting uh, WTBS into a into a cable uh, service and we're now in 51 percent of the homes in the country we did that without any must carry rules uh, we were may carry and 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 I was the the first one to attack the must carry rules because they were discriminatory I grew up in the south at a time when they had segregation when there were two classes of citizens and, and that's what we had in broadcasting. CNN and C-SPAN were not must-carry, just local CBS, NBC, and ABC stations who were my competitors. They had a tremendous advantage uh, over us in that, and I thought everyone should be playing on the, same, on the same level playing field and under the same rules. And after four years of asking the FCC to rule on it, which they never would do, we were able to uh, strike these rules down in the courts as being unconstitutional, the same way that Lester Maddox was finally forced to uh, serve minorities in his restaurant. And, but even so, since that occurred, we, we, we won a moral victory there. We didn't expect many stations to be dropped, and in fact, they weren't dropped. We haven't had must-carry rules now for three years. We just wanted everybody to be treated equally and fairly. And, and if, if, if there's some, uh, some reenactment that, that's reasonable on... Uh, on the must carry rules we'll probably go along with it scrambling is another is another issue i think that the, the current scrambling uh, uh... situation is is legal and, and 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 is working out and the market uh... is adapting the big problem with scrambling as i see it is that the the system that we came up with not we because i'm not an engineer is uh... very very easy to break and close to half the people are uh, are, 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 are breaking, uh, getting chips put in their scrambling boxes that, that give you all, this, all the signals for, uh, for free. Now, the, the greatest thing that I see as a threat to me, and remember, I'm not a cable operator, I am a programmer, and I have worked with these, these people in the cable industry for, for years, and uh, they may pose a threat, and, and really it's the programming that poses the threat, and, and I'm, on basic cable, probably the greatest threat uh, to the networks and to the local broadcasters because we have the largest share of the viewing in, in the cable homes. But last year, we only did $300 million in advertising. That's CNN and WTBS together. And each of the three major networks uh, 
The big networks did close to three billion. We are one tenth the size of our of our major competitors, and we have been clawing and scratching and fighting to uh, to get up to parity with uh, with them. And we built we we just had more foresight. And if we didn't have the cable subsidy in the form of subscriber fees, CNN wouldn't be here because last year we did two hundred million dollars, roughly, and about half of it was advertising, a hundred million, and and the other half was. Uh, was in, in subscriber fees. It wouldn't exist uh, otherwise. And the cost of operating that service, which all of you are familiar with, is, is just a little over $100 million a year, about one-third what the network's uh, news budgets are for, for four hours of news a, news a day. And uh, so we're much more, we've been forced to be much more efficient than, than, than the competition. No wonder they're worried. No wonder and, and Mr. Valeni's clients, and I used to be a member of his organization, which incidentally would not allow me when I had to sell a studio because I couldn't afford it, even though I owned 3,000 movies, I was not allowed to retain my membership in MPAA because I was seen as a, a competitor to it. They do most of their business with the big three networks who are getting hurt. He talked about three or four large cable companies. Before Mr. Malone and I started this business, and, and, and Mr. Baruch, there were only three big networks, and they totally dominated what people saw in the homes. Now they are close to 50 cable networks plus those three, plus those three networks, plus a lot of independent UHS stations that Mr. Padden represents that would not have been viable without cable coverage. When I started, I nearly went broke in 1970 with my UHF in independent station in Atlanta. And now the thing that really worries me is the reimposition of Syndex, the way that I'm concerned, although no final rules have been made, the Syndex regulations that, uh, that the FCC is preparing uh, to, 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 to uh, promulgate very shortly. I'm afraid that that's going to really, uh, really handicap us. We were hoping that there would be a, a phase-in period that would allow us to, uh, to burn off contracts that we've bought under the current rules that exceed over $100, uh, $100 million. And we're still hopeful that there'll be some sort of uh, reasonable compromise. I think it's going to be very, very difficult. When you think about the consumer, it's very difficult to take away stations that people have had for years and years. In Albany, New York, do the citizens of Albany not get the same kind of television service that the people in New York City have? And when those stations have been in there or in Birmingham, Alabama, shouldn't they be able to see the Braves games? I mean, I just think taking that away from people is anti-consumer. And there hasn't been that. Sure, the broadcasters are being hurt a little bit because there's more competition. When you've got 10 airlines, they're not going to do as well unless they're really outstanding if there's only one. You, Deregulated the, air, deregulated the airline business, and you've deregulated cable, and you've deregulated the broadcast business. And that's what's best for the consumers. Cable is terrific. If it wasn't, people wouldn't be subscribing to it the way they are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Turner, very, very much. Um, that concludes the opening uh, uh, testimony. And uh, now we'll turn to uh, questions from the subcommittee. Um, we will... You will be given an opportunity almost immediately, Mr. Baruch. I don't think, I don't think, uh, <clears throat> uh, we're going to, we might have to bring in a couple of referees here before the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> the um, um, the uh, subcommittee has uh, an outstanding attendance uh, uh, this morning amongst its membership, so we are going to uh, uh, strictly enforce our five-minute a rule for each member um, in terms of our questions and if the membership wishes we will then go to a second round of questions we'll poll the committee at the appropriate time to determine whether or not uh, that might be needed uh, so the chair recognizes itself at this point for an opening round of five minutes of questions um, let's go to you mr. Valenti you've uh, you've heard now what the cable industry uh, has to say um, you've heard their specific complaints about your industry um, can you touch upon the, this, this overriding issue of whether or not, in fact, uh, concentration in the cable industry uh, does, in fact, result in more programming diversity, uh, as they might contend, or less uh, in, the way that you, in the way that you are presenting your arguments here today? Can you deal with that question? Lay it out for us, how you see these trends developing and what you... Uh, uh, predict uh, six, eight, ten years down the line if we continue on the present course? <clears throat> well, none of my 
good friends. Can you move the microphone in a little bit closer? None of my friends here confronted the central issue. Uh, that Gandhi danced all over it. Uh, I, I must say, I, I, I think that Dr. Malone got a new role here. He played the role, of, he's a good actor, he played the role of St. Francis of Assisi very well. Uh, nobody confronted monopoly. Now, if you believe that it is right and just and reasonable and suitable to the consumers of this country that you have one cable system, uh, then fine. You have one telephone company, but I don't believe that that telephone company is allowed to operate without restraint. So none of them confronted the monopoly issue. Uh, indeed, do you realize that the top five cable systems, cable companies in this country control five, control 49% of all the subscribers? Just 17 days ago, a TCI and Comcast, just 17 days ago, bought uh, the Stora systems of 1.5 million subscribers. When is enough enough? Where does it end? What this committee has to determine is whether or not whatever the benefits that are provided by cable, and believe me, they provide a lot. I think cable has great potential for becoming a marvelous asset to the community. But whether or not that should be provided by a monopoly, that's the question you have to answer. I have before me. What does it mean for the consumer? Can you tell us what it will mean for the consumer? What I think it means for the consumer is that the, this monopoly can decide what the consumer ought to see. There are no com competition. If I try to sell something to Channel 5 and doesn't want to buy it, Channel maybe 20 or Channel 50 or Channel 4 or Channel 9, there's an alternative entry to the public. There is none now. Whatever the public is being served by a cable system, they have to take. They don't know what other new programs might be available because they have no alternative. Let me read to you about programming. I have this from one of the top people in the studio, and for obvious reasons, he doesn't want to be identified because uh, he has to deal with cable monopolies every day. And uh, this is what he says. A number of cable-generated networks have been created, not because of a lack of non-cable product suppliers, but because cable doesn't want non-cable suppliers to have control. Cable doesn't welcome or solicit non-cable suppliers, so they don't flourish. In the early 80s, there were dozens of suppliers willing to put networks together. But cable leveraged one network against another, NBC News versus Turner, Turner Music versus uh, MTV. Uh, a CBS cultural channel was rejected by cable, but Bravo was subsequently set up by cable. Producers are discouraged, discouraged from program packaging because cable cuts off the revenue spigot. Another example is the new cable service, Movie Time, a 24-hour service which includes screening of movie trailers with news and interviews from Hollywood. The press quoted the parties as saying, they had no interest in studio involvement because they thought it would be a detriment to dealing with cable. Now MSOs own it. Uh, NBC, a subsidiary of GE, has found it necessary upon purchase of, temp uh, or on purchase of, uh, of, uh, of its uh, uh, new program to advertise it will solicit MSO equity ownership up to 49%. Why? Mr. Valenti, I only have one minute left. I'd like to just give Mr. Baruch or Mr. Malone a chance to respond to you for that, uh, for that one minute, please. Mr. Baruch, which of you would like to take it? Pardon me? Which of you would like to respond to what I'd Mr. Like Valenti is? Some of Mr. Valenti's earlier remarks, if I may, please. Well, can, you, can someone just hear what Mr. Valenti is saying right now? Yeah, I, I think uh, clearly cable is not a monopoly at the present time. Uh, if you talk about Mr. Valenti's principal product, movies, okay, first of all, they go through theaters. Second of all, they go to video cassettes and are available virtually in every community that way. And this is before they show on cable. Then they go to pay-per-view, okay, and it, there's an interesting fight going on in pay-per-view right now. There's a cartel of movie studios, which is, in effect, has their own pay-per-view distribution arm, uh, which is uh, not selling their movies to competing pay-per-view packagers. Uh, after that, they have licensed perhaps HBO to be carried. So they've been in the marketplace for a year and a half or so before they finally get on cable in the form of HBO uh, or Showtime or D the Disney Channel, uh, depending on who has those contracts. After the first run on pay TV, they go to a network window. 
where they're distributed uh, by the networks over broadcast. Broadcast covers about 98% of this, the broadcast networks about 98% of the marketplace without cable carriage. So the consumer has that option of receiving them without cable. Uh, after that, they go back on pay cable, then they go into syndication, then they, then they go uh, foreign and everything else. So it's, there's no monopoly in terms of his principal product. My time has expired. The uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I jump into my questions, I certainly want to uh, once again compliment the panel. I think their testimony, and I speak for all of them, was interesting. Uh, it was certainly uh, comprehensive, illuminating, and even somewhat provocative and uh, kept everyone on their toes. Now, Mr. Valeni has said over and over again that the number one public policy issue surrounding the cable industry right now is, comp is a monopoly. And Mr. Malone dis just disputed that. He said clearly cable is not a monopoly at the present time. Let me ask you then, Mr. Malone, do you welcome or would you accept further competition for cable systems, either transmitted or owned by telephone companies, for example? Well, A, I welcome competition. Uh, I think that's the way our society works from anybody. With respect to telephone companies in their local markets, uh, having had some experience since I started life at AT&T, uh, I know quite well that the ability of the government to monitor and prevent cross-subsidization from a monopoly service to a non, to a competitive service is at best very, very difficult. And, uh, you know, on behalf of my investors, we would be scared to death if we had to compete with that one specific competitor. As far as I'm concerned, they could compete uh, and should compete in every market in which they don't have a monopoly service against which they could cross-subsidize. So, uh, you know, we think competition, technological change, is, uh, is the lifeblood of our society, and, it, and we can't stand in the way of that. We must Com respond to it. All right, competition is the lifeblood of our society, you just said. Are there any other competitors you wouldn't welcome, however? Uh, well, I, I mean, I w I'm a businessman, an investor. I wouldn't welcome any competitor, obviously. But, uh, but the, only, the only competitors that I would ask you not to set loose on us are those who have some monopoly position in the marketplace against which they can cross-subsidize. I mean, those are the only ones that I'm really concerned with. So you're, you're concerned to a certain extent about competition. Let me s switch over to Mr. Valenti now for a minute, because what you really did in your testimony was, in effect, decried increasing vertical integration in the cable industry. Now, as I see it, there are probably two prime ways to increase or introduce more competition. And one is by putting limitations on ownership of cable systems. And the other is letting other competitors into the market, including telephone companies, as I just mentioned. Now, what I'd like to uh, hear and have you respond to is which alternative you think would be the most effective way to assure that there isn't a monopoly and increase competition in the marketplace and reduce the prominence of the presently dominant cable companies? That's an insightful question, Mr. Congressman, and I will answer as follows. I think that there needs to be a thoughtful, serious appraisal of the entry of telcos. On December 11th, I sent a little piece of paper to the FCC and said that I think they have to consider uh, the insertion of, uh, of telcos, but they've got to do it by clear-eyed regulatory oversight of telco activities in all aspects of their operation. I agree with Mr. Malone. I think that uh, the telco is, is a mighty competitor, and they could be a, a giant monopolist themselves, but if they are guided and supervised and monitored, uh, it is possible that that could be uh, circumvented. Number two, there is another way, uh, two other ways. One is to mandate by congressional fiat that the majority of cable channels on a system be mandated for non-cable-owned programs, which would, would mandate access to this broadband, multi-channel video service into the home, and there's only one right now, so that programmers could have a chance to get their programs on. Number three is direct broadcast satellite which is non-wired, going directly to the home. But again, you've got a problem, and that is that uh, 
for example, uh, and, 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 uh, and that TCI, for example, is already involved in, in, uh, in going up to the uh, satellite to have uh, DBS, and I think that it is important that the DBS not be under the control of the cable industry. I think that's very important. Otherwise, you just move one monopoly over to the, over to the other. And therefore, so DBS, possible entry of telcos under heavily supervised uh, regulation. Third is the mandating of access to cable channels, 36 channels, 54 channels. Mandate that the majority of these channels be absolutely accessible to those who don't have an equity interest in that cable system. Okay. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Eckert. Thank the chairman. Uh, to the panel, I would say we've had a lot of discussion about monopolies. I'm not quite sure I understood what we were talking about, so I got out my Black's Law Dictionary. It says, under monopoly, a privilege or peculiar advantage vested in one or more persons or companies consisting in the exclusive right or power to carry on a particular business or trade. I'm not sure if that added a whole lot of illumination to the debate, but I, I did note with interest that you'll find the word monopoly in between the words monomania, which is referenced as insanity, and monster, a prodigious, a prodigious birth. <laughs> I suspect that the word monopoly is appropriately placed in the Black's Law Dictionary in between a monstrous insanity which is perhaps what we created in 19, 1985. Uh, Dr. Malone, my problem is, is that while you reference that there may in fact not be a monopoly, I thought I'd gotten away from that book a few years ago, the people in my district don't always agree that that's, that's the case. We find in, in my peculiar district, which has uh, the benefits of your company's operations, just an absolute outpouring of, of problems. TCI removed C-SPAN to provide uh, opportunities for your cable value network. Now, some folks would suggest that probably was a good program decision, uh, given what we sometimes put on C-SPAN. But CVN is something that, that you own. Uh, TCI moved a local station, WUAB, that had been in business for 20 years uh, to provide another service that you own. When we took these complaints to your manager, we were told, and I quote, if I don't like the cable service, I could go out and buy a dish. That hardly reflects well, A, on your company, B, on your corporate attitude, and C, on your interests in supporting the community, which is in a monopoly position. How can you justify those maneuvers, given my constituents' views of having their hands tied by your corporate attitude? Well, I guess, first of all, we're not, <coughs> we're not perfect, excuse me. We are decentralized, and our, our operations... Uh, uh, sometimes air. Um, we don't own CVN, nor do we own, we really don't own anything. We have very small non-controlling ownership interests in various things. But you are an owner, uh, one of the owners of CVN. Uh, of C-SPAN also. Uh, we, uh, in fact, we probably have a larger interest in C-SPAN than we do in CVN. Um, so that's an unfortunate uh, error. With respect to uh, the availability of the dish, I guess uh, that does demonstrate that there is at least one competitive available. But I might, I might say really seriously on your definition of monopoly, uh, where cable systems have become excessive or uh, overpriced or not fill the public need, uh, there is the possibility of a second cable system being built, and in fact that has happened in a number of, uh, of communities. Nowhere do we hold exclusive right to build a cable system. And there are a number of communities in which uh, direct cable competition has happened. Well, so that is, that is in fact uh, uh, one of the alternatives. It might be a right, Mr. Malone, but there's another old law school saying that the a right without a remedy is a right that doesn't necessarily exist. And 
if we go into what the competition may be, so-called wireless cable, we have a plethora of stories about how Showtime, for instance, won't negotiate with the wireless people. Several lawsuits vested against Showtime seems to make it not a uh, uh, not really a viable opportunity. Sure, they have a legal right to do that, but that doesn't mean if they can't affect that right that they really have any opportunity. Have you made a pattern in practice of dropping C-SPAN from any of your other cable systems? No, I believe our carriage of C-SPAN is uh, is pretty complete in the company. Could I ask uh, you to survey to see if, if uh, my district's experience was peculiar within your own companies? Certainly. I would I would appreciate that and, and once again you hate to use these kinds of hearings for those kinds of circumstances but they're it's important to my constituents because they have to ask me whether or not these these laws are working mr. Turner let me uh, I passed when Edward Bennett Williams was before us a few weeks ago and asking him to come in about the Orioles so I won't ask you to talk about the Braves but uh, uh, let me talk about something that that I think is uh, of some concern to this committee in terms of, of, of programming and that is the prospects that uh, uh, major league sports of every level is going to ultimately be on pay-per-view. We had a member from New York, I think, introduce a bill when uh, uh, Mr. Steinbrenner decided to put a large share of Yankees games on, uh, on, on, on a pay-per-view basis. Are we going to get to the point where there will be little, if any, broadcast of, of major league sports? Maybe all the pl playoff <coughs> games, World Series games will be on pay-per-view or on on ESPN <coughs> as we now have some of the NFL games? Are, are we getting to the point where, where average fans may need to have cable or pay TV in order to view uh, home team sports? Uh, it's, I mean, the member's time has expired, but the witness may answer the question. Okay. Well, it's, it's really hard to tell exactly what the, what, what the, future, uh, what the future holds. But certain sports have already gone to cable, like hockey, because the broadcast networks didn't want them. The, the broadcasters only want things they can make money off of. I mean, as a broadcaster, turn of broadcasting, system, I know that. And, and the sports owners sell their rights normally to where they can get the most money. And that's really what, uh, what determines how these, how these things uh, occur. Just like uh, movies basically went off uh, free television and, and, and went, to, went to pay cable. That has occurred and a lot of sporting events have already gone. Whether all of them will go or not, we'll, uh, we'll just have to really wait and see. But in a free marketplace, uh, unless you pass rules, this Congress has the right to pass a rule anytime you want to, uh, to do it, to take away the rights of the sports owners if you want to do so. If you want to let it be a free country, then, uh, then the free market will work however it works. <laughs> <laughs> gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Coates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. While that last answer is settling in here, let me see if I can <laughs> formulate a question to Mr. Valeni. Mr. Valeni, you said in your uh, testimony, which was very well given, in fact, my colleague here, Mr. Moorhead, said that uh, you missed your calling. You should have been on the uh, other end of the uh, movie business but uh, uh, and you would have done extremely well had you done that I'm sure but let me just ask you this you the, the thing that keeps coming back to me and I think your central point was is that there uh, there are no options out left out there to the consumer and you said the the alternatives uh, uh, were suicide and bowling but that really isn't true is it I mean with the proliferation in the last 10 years or so uh, of VCR, of satellite, of uh, independent television stations, of uh, public broadcasting stations, um, of cable. Uh, doesn't the consumer today have more choices than, than, than he ever had? And weren't, aren't the arguments that you're making, uh, aren't those weren't those same arguments made at each stage of technological breakthrough in the communications industry? In fact, at one time period, uh, movies uh, essentially had a monopoly. And then television came along. And weren't those arguments made at the, as television came in that, that, um, uh, uh, th that this, this threat was going to undo the, uh, uh, the movie industry? And then we had a monopoly of movies and, te and network television. And then... Uh, uh, cable came along and uh, th then we had a monopoly of movies network television and cable and then uh, VCR came along and 
then, then we had a monopoly of, of uh, movies, television, cable, and VCR, and then satellite, and we added satellite to it, and who knows what the next uh, potential breakthrough is going to be. But aren't all these an ex a dilution of monopoly power? Aren't these an expansion of uh, choices for the consumer? Where, what am I missing here? Well, I have said... Seems like I have more choice than ever. I said in my testimony that uh, however you want to describe what I'm saying, it's not a rage against cable. That cable has the possibility of becoming one of the most marvelous assets that the public has. Multiple choices, multi-channel broadband video services into the home. The problem is how you describe Monopoly. Now, if I don't like what's playing at the MacArthur Theater, I can move off and go to 20 other theaters. Uh, if I don't like, uh, if I'm not on cable, if I don't like what's playing on one network, I go to another. If I don't like the service, I think, or I don't like the attitude of a network or a television station, I have others to choose from. But, but can but I choose between those? Can't, if I don't like, assuming that everything on cable is, is monopoly controlled and I don't have a choice, which I'm not sure I agree with because I can switch to an awful lot of different cable stations or different types of programming, but assuming that I don't have that option, can I switch to another form of, of entertainment? Can I switch to networks? Can I switch to VCRs? Can I buy a satellite dish if that's... Uh, well, what I was saying, to finish up, Mr. Congressman, yeah. was the last sentence on what I was saying was that if you don't like your cable system for whatever reason, there is no choice. That's the central theme that runs like a scarlet thread throughout this... Well, there's a the choice of not having cable. I beg your pardon? There's a choice of not subscribing well, that's to right. I have a choice of not having a telephone. I can write a letter. Uh, and that's my choice there. But the point is that it's not really a choice to a consumer. Uh, I don't have to have a car. I can ride a street car or I can ride my bicycle. That's my choices. Those aren't Are, are really you saying that cable is so superior to your product or to VCR or to... Uh, Mr. Uh, Congressman, cable is a delivery system. That's what it ought to be. It's a delivery system. That's what it is. It's only when the delivery system just as the movies in 1948 owned the theaters and they owned the movie th studios and they owned everything and the government broke that up in 1948 because it was a monopoly and they thought that they ought not have programs, they ought not have the theater and the studio and everything else. But the central theme here is that to the consumer he wants to be on cable. The first thing they do when they put on cable is they take down your antenna so that you don't have a chance to go and find anything outside what you're looking at if they're not carrying a certain station. But shouldn't that be the consumer's choice as to whether he wants to be on cable or not, or have an antenna, or go down to the VCR store and rent videos, or maybe... Uh, Mr. Congressman, I have no quarrel with that. If, th if this Congress believes that it is in the long-term interest of the public that there be only one cable system that could also own the programs and decide all that, fine. I, I live by the rules. I don't make them. But I'm saying to you, I think that's a key question that this this panel has to examine. Mr. Malone, would you respond to that? Yeah, I would start by saying the reason I said it's not a monopoly at this time. If the gentleman's time has expired, but the witness may answer the question. Uh, so said it's not that. a monopoly at this time is that when the Congress passed the Cable Act, I think they had the foresight to empower the FCC to review the status in the cable industry. And at the point in time, perhaps when cable reaches 75 or 80 percent, right now only half of the people uh, have cable. The other half choose not to subscribe to cable and get their entertainment by broadcast or videotape for theater. Well, it's not choice for a lot of people don't have the choice of subscribing to cable. That cable, I mean, it's, cable what's, now what's is the available. percentage versus cable access? Now, cable now is available in about 90% of TV households. Okay, roughly 90%, uh, of which, you know, half are cable subscribers, half choose not to. And I think the FCC is empowered under the Cable Act to review periodically what the competitive status is and to reimpose uh, ra rate regulation okay, in those communities or at that point in time that cable was reviewed, regarded by them as monopoly. So I think this group has already dealt with that issue and put it in the cable bill. The gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Ritter. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I uh, am one of those people who loves to watch late night movies and I don't have cable precisely because of the fact that there are too many movies on cable that I might watch. Therefore, I would <laughs> never get to sleep. Um, 
<laughs> but I, I also am one of these people who is constantly uh, at the local IGA picking up uh, video cassettes because the times that I get to watch movies are not, uh, not necessarily prime times on any channel. And uh, it, it just seems to me that uh, I could also, I live out on a, on a hillside in Pennsylvania when I'm not down here, um, and I could, have, I could have a satellite pretty easily. Uh, certainly in my home, and I guess in, in half of those 90%, uh, 90% of the American homes have access to cable, about 40% are not picking it up. Obviously, uh, they are not constrained by this monopoly, so it's not the same thing as a telephone. But Mr. Valeni makes a good point, and, and that is the, if there is a uh, regulated uh, uh, oversight on telephone company carriage that puts you in the exact same position as a cable company as so many other information services yours is just visual information video um, it seems to me that once that technology is available especially if the glass fiber uh, costs come down and it gets into the household uh, you might have a glass fiber too, you see, that's another thing. And then the, and then the expansiveness of the cable uh, goes forward. Why shouldn't the telephone companies have access if you can over oversee and regulate it? And we, we have the same discussion over information services here, and basically we're moving towards allowing the telephone companies to engage in, uh, at least at this stage, transmission of information services, uh, messaging, uh, gateways and the whole. Could you, could you respond to that? Yeah, I think that, uh, that there's a lot of experimentation going on now in terms of optical fiber, its application for video delivery, the architectures involved in that. In fact, uh, our organizations uh, just uh, uh, funded a, an R&D center for the cable industry, a cable labs, as it were, to study these issues for our industry. Uh, it may well be that the most efficient way to provide services to the American home is one super monopoly company with shared facilities using optical fibers. If that's the case, you know, that would be, a, I think, a, a judgment, a public interest judgment that the, uh, uh, that the Congress ought to make. Uh, well, I think the te technology is moving very fast. Very and, fast. I, and, I, and if uh, glass fiber uh, and it gets anywhere near the home via the telephone company, I don't see how you're going to be able to keep at least them as conduits, just like cable yeah. in so many respects when you don't own the, the uh, programming is, is a conduit. I'd like to get to one other question, the DBS question that he raised. Uh, what about that Oh, cross-ownership between cable and direct broadcast if it ever got to the point where uh, the two were two out of the three of the major transmission systems into the home, and perhaps with HDTV, the only two that had the high level of quality. Could you comment on that? Yeah, uh, obviously, if if uh, the purpose of uh, uh, DBS is to compete with cable, then it would be likely that uh, you'd want to see robust competition, and you wouldn't want to see that that industry uh, controlled by cable. Uh, we feel that it's important for us to be in that industry because we see it a different way. We see DBS as a way to make sure that the 10% the of America that cable can't get to can be served in a cost-effective way. And uh, so we, you know, we, re we regard, with respect to serving the whole country, a DBS solution as the only practical way of making sure that programming like TEDS can be received by everybody. Although DBS could be very different in a, as the technology moves if HDTV came real quick. That's correct. There first. But, but I think that, that from our perspective, localism, this is one of the reasons, frankly, we think we're an ally with local broadcasters and the concept of localism, because a national DBS scheme would not be able to satisfy the local needs of the com communities uh, the way that cable and broadcast can. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you, the Chairman. We appreciate this participation. Um, just for the uh, information of those who are 
of viewing this. This is the largest subcommittee in the uh, Congress. There are 25 members on the committee, and almost every one of them uh, has uh, decided that this is an important enough hearing that they have been uh, sitting through it today. And so we're limiting each one of the rounds of questions to five minutes. Um, and it's with the attempt to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to participate. There's a roll call on the floor at this moment, uh, and there's approximately uh, 11 minutes, 12 minutes left to go before the roll call will go up. Uh, the intention of the chair at this point is to recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Bryant, for his five minutes of questions, uh, and then we'll recess, and then we'll come back uh, and recommence the uh, hearing. Uh, at the conclusion of that roll call on the floor. So the chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Bryant, for his round of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Turner, I was uh, pleased to learn that you're apparently not categorically opposed to syndicated exclusivity, but have expressed some thought that perhaps you could live with it or your industry could live with it if there was a transition rule attached to it. And I wondered if you would elaborate on that. Uh, what kind of a rule could you live with? Thank you, Mr. Bryant. First of all, uh, we have been operating as a, a cable network slash superstation since the beginning, and but we're the only station that has done that. And uh, if syndicated exclusivity is put back, is, is reinstated, we would like to be able to uh, to 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 be able to use the contracts that we that we now have that we bought under this uh, current set of rules until they expire. And about 20% of these contracts expire each year for the for the next five years. But from a <coughs> consumer standpoint, what this will mean is uh, that would mean that uh, all programs that were owned by a local station and by a distant station, because we're not the only super station, and, th and then there's a lot of, uh, a lot of stations that, uh, like the Dallas station, uh, it's being fed by a satellite, so it's a super station, where people in the smaller markets uh, get the Texas Ranger games. Those stations would be, who didn't really want to be super stations, they, it's just good for the consumers. It was good for, for viewers uh, around the state to be able to, to, to have that. That will be lost to them because those stations are going to have to go off the systems because there are going to be so many blackouts that the cable systems will probably choose to uh, drop them. So th the broadcasters will be slight winners with syndicate, uh, syndicate exclusivity coming back in. I don't think they'll be big winners. They'll be slight winners because the programs available on the local station, there's a lot more promotion there, and the local stations get a lot higher ratings than, than distant stations do uh, anyway when it's, the, <coughs> when it's the same program. There's more loyalty to, uh, to local stations. The, the consumers will be big losers. The viewers will be big losers, and, and you're going to be hearing about it. I, I really think that what will happen if syndicate exclusivity is put in is there's going to be a flood of letters and mail and complaints like this Congress has never seen before. Because over half the people in the country enjoy these stations and they're going to lose them, and there's going to be a hue and cry. And, and so there's going to have a small winners, the local broadcasters, and big losers, the consumers. For me, I just want to be able to make a transition to a cable network and have an orderly time to do so. That's uh, because that's the rules we've been playing on. Mm -hmm. Mr. Valenti, I, I was curious about your response to that, and also uh, your response to the fact that the local cable operators also predict a revolution if we incorporate uh, syndicated exclusivity into the regulations or the law. My comment on on syndicate exclusivity? Yes. I think and that... And the transition period. I think that you could do it very easily uh, because there is ample opportunity for cable systems to uh, replace whatever that half hour is that's being blanked out, to replace it with an, another half hour. There's thousands of programs out there. In my own judgment, entrepreneurs will spring up to provide that kind of service. They always do. And uh, I don't, uh, I think that you'll have some outcry because I think the cable companies will incite it and say if uh, beginning on January 1st, you better write Congressman Bryant because uh, we're going to have all your programs going to be blanked out. It's quite possible that some cable systems may even put a blank screen up there. Say, call Congressman Bryant if you're unhappy with this. <laughs> uh, I, it has happened before. And uh, so uh, keep in mind that the cable system <coughs> can do that since they <laughs> operate the system. And, uh, but my judgment is that, uh, that there'd be ample, uh, ample programming to substitute for whatever it was uh, that some local station wanted to protect. 
I don't think all the programs will be protected. Some of the older programs, the local station won't even bother about it. But I think if the Cosby Show or Who's the Boss or something like that, which you've paid an enormous amount of money for as a lead-in to your next show on the local station, and then the cable system is bringing in a half hour earlier someplace, I think you'd have a genuine uh, right to say this is unfair. Because keep in mind, Mr. Bryant, that cable, and I'm, and I'm, I'm essentially with them on this, that I think they ought to have the right to exclusively uh, 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 license program as local stations do, but you can't have it both ways. You can't say, I want to exclusively license, and I don't want to have somebody else having it, but I'm not going to allow the local station to have it. So I think that there is a middle ground there, but I do believe that the, uh, that the cries of doom, the Cassandras that in, infest the cable systems today are, are, uh, are just wrong. Mr. Turner, can you substitute them? You have a big inventory, I'm sure, of programs. No, well, that's the problem. We don't know that. No, we couldn't. We couldn't run. We, we, we would have to pull the whole inventory because it, there, there are 35 uh, channels on the, on the current systems, and we couldn't take being blacked out. Uh, so we'd have to, if, if we were blacked out in two or three markets out of the 220 markets that we're in, that would be unacceptable. <laughs> we just can't go black because the audience doesn't come back, and our advertisers wouldn't know where it was. We, we'd have no way of uh, knowing this inventory of programming that we've purchased over the years, and we don't have any of this programming. We, we haven't been able to buy Cosby. In our, our case, we are unique. We're the only superstation that's come out of the closet and said, we're a superstation, we know it, we're proud of it, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and we're programming, we're co going to compete with NBC, CBS, and ABC, and, we, but, and Jack Maleney, by gosh, he says he doesn't have a problem with older programming. That's all we have. But at his, when he goes to the FCC and when he goes around the lobby, he wants all programming knocked out. He speaks with forked tongue, my good friend. <laughs> <laughs> he speaks out of both sides of his mouth, which is something I don't do. Well, the gentleman, the gentleman, I the gentleman, the, do the gentleman, the gentleman, the gentleman, the gentleman, along from, with the rest of them. The, the gentleman from Texas's time has expired, but I do believe that Mr. Valenti deserves a brief moment to respond. There's no way that Ted Turner is going to make me mad at him. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the, mad at him. The Jack. point is that WTBS as a station, uh, Mr. Turner has got his rules mixed up. He can't substitute programming for WTBS uh, because on distant signal on the FCC rules, you can't take out the programming on the distant signal and substitute other programming. So I don't know what his advertisers would complain about. They're advertising on an Atlanta station. And that's where his, uh, his rights uh, uh, lie. They are not advertising on Atlanta Station. They're advertising on a super station that covers 50% of the country. But under the FCC rules, you can't substitute a, sup a super station you're advertising. If you're advertising nationwide, as he says he is, uh, well, then I think that uh, his contracts ought to show that he has exclusive rights to the national scene. I don't think his contracts show that. I think his contracts say he has Atlanta rights only. We're going to take a brief commercial break, and, uh, and after a approximately a 10-minute recess, we will return, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and each of the witnesses, again, will be given ample opportunity to expound. Uh, I want to just uh, notify uh, uh, those who are interested that uh, my nuclear test ban readiness amendment has been called up to the floor, and the debate is going to begin. Uh, in the very near future, and since we will be having a roll call on it in the very near future, I will have to be uh, quarterbacking that debate on the floor for those that support uh, that position on the nuclear test ban. So uh, I apologize, and there will be another uh, member in the chair uh, to uh, ensure that there is a fair treatment of all the witnesses. So we'll take a brief recess. All of the witnesses are, are back except Mr. Baruch, who I happen to know is making a phone call and will be joining us shortly. Uh, if there was someone <laughs> here from Mr. Baruch's uh, staff and may have lost him, he will find him in the first doorway down the hall and uh, just let him know we're resuming. With that chair recognized for five minutes, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Vani, it seems to me that uh, you're essentially making an antitrust argument uh, in regard to the uh, alleged monopoly of the uh, cable industry. Uh, have you uh, testified before the Judiciary Committee and specifically the antitrust uh, uh, com uh, subcommittee of that uh, distinguished committee? 
make an antitrust argument. To, I mean, that lies beyond my sphere. The kind of argument I'm trying to make is that I think that there is ample uh, provisioning of power within this committee and the Judiciary Committee to make sensible adjustments in the marketplace which don't do any terrorizing damage to the cable industry because I think the cable industry is important and it needs to be uh, nourished. All that I think needs to be done is some adjustments uh, so that more competition uh, infuses itself into the marketplace and, and I have some specific recommendations on that. Do you think that uh, cable should be treated as a public utility like we treat uh, sewer and water or electricity or uh, uh, telephones? Well, I am, I am by nature a free market man, and I, I, I really feel uncomfortable with, uh, with too much government regulation of any kind. Uh, sometimes it's required, I'll, I with the telephone companies, for example. But I think it is possible to evade all of that and to make the adjustments with, within uh, uh, a setting that doesn't bring in a, a harsh and unremitting kind of government supervision. Well, it seems to me that you, you've got to go one way or the other. Either treat the cable as a, as a public utility and have them regulated or re-regulated, or you have, in some cases, in many cases, perhaps two cable systems serving the same community. Um, and one of the reasons that government has granted monopolies in the past to public utilities has been because it doesn't make any economic sense to have two phone companies serving the same community or two sewer and waters or whatever it may be. Um, so that, do you agree with me that you've, you, you've got to go one way or the other on this? With all due respect, uh, Mr. Congressman, I, I don't quite agree with that. I think telephone service is a finite service. You, you call somebody. Programming is infinite. Uh, you can have all sorts of programming. Uh, uh, one uh, cable system might be showing the hockey game and the other cable system is showing a movie. Uh, one is showing basketball and another is showing a, a, a sitcom. What about the cost of uh, running the wire and uh, all of the concomitant costs that go with cable system? Mr. Baruch has told us the uh, large expense that uh, cable went to in building the infrastructure of the cable system. So we're saying we want to go back to uh, providing for uh, dual systems in some cases where, uh, where the cable companies would have to uh, make the necessary capital uh, infusion uh, to, uh, to bring about some kind of uh, double service to, uh, to our constituents. I, don't, I don't, frankly don't think that makes any sense. Well, I'm, I don't think you can mandate a second wire into the home. What you can do is they'll make it possible for competitors to come in. For example, direct broadcast satellite is a competitor. But some of the suggestions that, that, that I have made and will continue to make is, uh, uh, is, is not to disrupt the cable infrastructure, and I think they have spent uh, multi-millions of dollars to put it in place. I understand that. But I think by doing some adjustments within this committee and the Judiciary Committee and within the FCC, I think it is possible to provision the cable marketplace with more competition that is presently available and to allow independent programmers who are not part of the cable industry uh, to come to the public and offer their wares and would then let the public make the choice of what it is they want to see. Mr. Turner, uh, there's been recent uh, stories that the networks have lost a substantial percentage of their viewers. Um, and I can remember back uh, when, uh, when I was my son's age, for example, where about the only choice I had were the, th matter of fact, in <coughs> some cases, Two, two major networks, and then finally a third, um, and think the world has changed since then. And, uh, and I'd be interested, one of your uh, endearing qualities to me has been the fact that you've broken the monopoly of the major networks, um, and that uh, by providing the kind of alternate service to, cons to uh, my constituents and the viewers, you've given them a real choice, and they've indeed made that choice. Um, haven't we come a long way uh, since uh, when I was uh, 15 years old uh, now and, and the availability that my 15-year-old son has in terms of what he can watch uh, on television? Absolutely, sir. You're right. There were, uh, were, there were real, really only three entities producing programs uh, 25 years ago, 20 years ago. And now there, I think, uh, 
counting all the cable channels, there's something like 50 different channels on the satellite that are, that, that are available. So there has been tremendous, uh, tremendous growth there. Well, you're to be commended. Uh, you're the only uh, news network that carry the president's address on uh, contra aid, one of the most important uh, public policy issues that this Congress and this nation had to face. And uh, in the face of the three major networks uh, saying no to the president, I want to commend you on, uh, on carrying that and, uh, and feeling your public responsibility to do that. Uh, Mr. Malone, it appears you obviously have no fear of Mr. Valenti, uh, but apparently you do have some fear of the telcos. Um, and um, first of all, I'd like to ask you, is there any way possible you think that the Congress could craft legislation that would uh, so uh, insulate the, uh, the public utility section of the uh, telcos uh, from perhaps a cable uh, business that would be effective in, uh, in avoiding the cross-subsidization that you fear so greatly? Well, I, I suppose that if uh, the phone companies came in in their operating areas and did so in separate subsidiaries with separate facilities and separate staffs and so on, uh, perhaps. But I think that begs the question about whether or not shared facilities turn out to be a, a, an optimum delivery mechanism. So uh, having you know, spent the first part of my career at Bell Labs and AT&T, uh, and having actually worked on the Bell system side of testimony to the FCC, uh, I know that it's very, very difficult for regulatory agencies to supervise accounting and, and uh, 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 cost accounting and shared uh, overheads and, and all of the other uh, intricacies of running a business and calling it too. I mean, it's a very difficult task, and because they st they have a strong incentive, in effect, to cross subsidize, uh, you know, we would be quite fearful that there would be an in incentive for them to do so. Even if they didn't intend to, they would do it. Well, Mr. Rook, let me ask you that as well. It's my uh, feeling that uh, while cable fears no man, uh, certainly uh, the telcos uh, send a distinct chill up the spine of our friends from the cable industry. Uh, uh, is that a fair statement? Yes, I believe it is. And we have saw that through the Congress seeing it necessary to pass the Pole Attachment <laughs> Act uh, some years ago when uh, the cable television industry was unable to get fair rates from the phone companies even to attach their, their cables on the poles owned by the, uh, by the phone companies. Time of the gentleman has expired. Thank you. Was the witness... Uh, well, I, I want to correct a couple of points which were made earlier, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity. Um, Mr. Valenti quoted that the top five companies in the cable television industry represented 49%. And someone else said that not only is my good friend Jack Valenti silver tongue, but maybe fork tongue as well. And, but certainly the letter that he read, which claimed that some companies tried to get into the... Uh, provision of programming services to the cable television industry. When I was CEO at v Viacom, I did not uh, hear the door knock uh, upon by some of Mr. Valenti's clients. Uh, but if we are talking about concentration, uh, we should keep in mind that the top four motion picture companies represent nearly 57 percent of all box office receipts in the country, and the top eight represent uh, Eighty-seven percent of the box office uh, receipts in this country, and this is going to go up because I read this morning in the newspapers that uh, one of the uh, studios bought another one out, so there's even going to be further concentration. On top of which, we ought to realize uh, that Mr. Um, uh, Valenti mentioned the theaters, um, which were owned by the motion picture company years ago, that was ruled illegal. Well, that... Um, and Illegality has been lifted by the Justice Department, and since that time, nearly 3,000 theaters have been bought up by these same motion picture companies, some of which are incidentally own uh, a small television network, television stations. So concentration, if, if we are talking about concentration, we ought to look at that end of the industry as well. Mr. Baruch, I can feel a rebuttal coming on, uh, and uh, uh, I don't want to take too much time. Mr. Valenti? I had not intended, I put this in my written testimony because I knew that uh, this old musket would be fired sooner or later, and I wanted to, it never hits its target, and so... Or a cannon. Uh, uh, one of the things that you should know is, if I ask a question of this committee, 
Who do you think is the largest owner of theater screens in the United States? The owner is TCI. TCI, the largest cable system, owns the largest number of theater screens. More theater screens than all the film studios combined. That's point number one. Point number two, yes, the four companies did have probably 50%, but it's, the not it's not the same four companies each year. In our business, one year Universal, because at ET, is on top with 27%. The next year they can't get arrested. Uh, the next year, because of a Clint Eastwood movie, Warner Brothers is on top. Two years later, Warner Brothers is struggling. Our business is an up and down business that depends on the caliber of films in the marketplace. And if the public chooses somebody else's films, the top guy one year becomes the bottom guy the next year. Not so in the cable business. There, each cable system is on the outer edge of an ascending curve that continues upward, never changing the leadership because they don't have to fool around with the pesky disaffections of a capricious public. They got a subscriber. <laughs> That's all, gentlemen. Pesky disaffections of a public. <laughs> gentleman from Oklahoma, recognized for five minutes. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Let me ask a couple of real brief questions. Uh, Ted, uh, you said earlier that you pay the Atlanta market uh, rate for your programming. The uh, implications Talk to me about programming. I mean, the implication is that you're getting a windfall charging national advertising rates for Atlanta rate paying on the front. Tell me, well, no, explain no. it to me. That's, 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 I, I didn't say that, or if I did, it was, uh, it was incorrect. Uh, we pay a negotiated rate based on our, uh, based on, uh, our coverage. And the way it works with, with film, particularly old films, because that's all we're allowed to buy. We don't uh, have access to the first run programs uh, because the syndicators won't sell them to us because it creates too much trouble with them in the, in the other markets. We weren't able to bid on Cosby or Wheel of Fortune or Star Trek from Paramount and so forth. Uh, uh, we, we, the film companies charge as much as they can and buyers pay as little as they can. But on average, I would say for the old product that, 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 that we are running, we're paying somewhere between three and seven or eight times as much as we would pay if we were just a local Atlanta, Atlanta station. So we pay a, we pay a, a rate for non-exclusive. Some programming we, we buy exclusively, like the NBA we have exclusively. Uh, Cousteau, we, we, we're the originator of. Uh, National Geographic, <laughs> Audubon. Although we have, we, we syndicate those programs right away, we turn around and syndicate them. In the case of Audubon, we, we give it to public broadcasting to run. In the case of Cousteau, we syndicate it to the broadcasters. And a highlight program each month of, of, our, auto, of our National Geographic program, we syndicate as well. So we're in, uh, we, we syndicate the programming to the, to the broadcasters, but we, we pay a, uh, a higher price and, and, and we get a higher rate from the advertisers. All right. Jack, you mentioned earlier that you thought one of the ways to, uh, to check this monopoly is to guarantee that half of the cable channels be available to uh, other people. You know, uh, Mr. Malone in his testimony said that uh, it's been his recollection that when MPAA or your, uh, your, cust your uh, people you represent had the opportunity, uh, they did just the opposite. They sold. They really didn't want a part of the action. Are you telling us now that they do want that and that's why we need to protect the 50%? I, I didn't, the 50% figure is what, Mr. Congressman, I don't, I don't quite understand, 50%. Did you not say that you thought half of the channels... No, sir, I did not. Okay. Who said I that? said that a large number of the channels, large percentage of the channels on any cable system ought to be mandated to be for carriage or entry by non-cable-owned programs. That's what I said. I did okay. not give a number, sir. Okay. A majority being... Well, I'd say if it were about 2080, that would be about right. 20% for cable-owned programs and 80% for non-cable-owned programs. Oh, so I was being conservative in my estimates. Well, of it, what you conservative you... Or, or, or liberal, depending on which end of the well, telescope Jack, you're looking Jack, answer the through. question. I think John pointed out that uh, Warner, I think, is the example you used, uh, didn't show much interest. Are you saying now that uh, there's an interest there that you all want to get in? I think what he's saying, I, don't, I, I didn't quite understand the, the allusion to Warner's, but... Uh, uh, what I am saying, which is the only person I, I know what, uh, what is, is being said, first is that I have five recommendations that I have, want to make for 
easing what I think is, is the undeniable grip of, of cable on the delivery of this multi-channel broadband <coughs> video service. One is to sunset the compulsory license. Sunset it. You don't need it. Sunset it in about three years. <coughs> in the interim, reimpose syndicated exclusivity until the sunset license is done, and then when you've sunsetted a license, you don't need syndicated exclusivity anymore. Number three, work out a suitable must-carry and channel repositioning uh, bargain with the cable people, which NAB and INTV are, are, are suitably qualified to work out. Four, put a limit on individual MSO growth. I think one of the things you've got to do is to limit horizontal growth, and that is, at, at what point do you allow one, two, or three companies to control so many subscribers? So put a limit, say 10 to 12 percent. Uh, number five, mandate access by non-cable-owned programs to the local cable system. If you have a 36-channel system, uh, say that nine or ten channels would be available for cable-owned programs and whatever must-carries they had, and then the rest of the pro rest of the channels ought to be available to non-cable-owned programmers. And that way you don't have a conflict of interest anymore. Then you, you, uh, you uh, extract that thorn uh, from the cable hide, and there you can go on to, uh, to do other things, which I think would increase competition. That, I believe, would allow the cable industry to flourish and keep flourishing, and at the same time, install competition. Jack, I'm disappointed you didn't answer my question. You gave another opening statement. I mean, I was really interested in knowing the new interests that you, <coughs> you seem to want to indicate uh, that you're interested in, and, and I'm giving you an opportunity to say that you have this new interest. It, the other people who have testified today said that when the MPAA and their companies have had the opportunity to be involved, uh, Mr. Baruch and Mr. Malone, they haven't taken advantage of it. Now you're coming in here and saying that we have to mandate uh, a certain percentage of the channel's availability. My question again to you, are you saying now you all are interested in participating in that? The time the gentleman has expired, the, the that, witness Mr. can ask the question. The answer is yes, 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 yes. Okay, thank you. The gentleman from California is recognized for thank five you, minutes. Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I want to thank all the members of the panel. It's not often that we get <coughs> two such colorful people as Jack Valenti and Ted Turner on the same panel here, and we appreciate having you today. Uh, the, other, the others are very colorful also. <laughs> <laughs> I got a letter this morning from, I'd rather the, be rich than colorful. from the city of Pasadena. And uh, they say all politics is local, but they have a problem, and I know many other communities in the country may be having the same kind of problem. They say while they get along well with cable, they're having a very difficult time to get the Linda Vista area covered by cable even though their contracts call for it. And they also express the, the concern that uh, public access television covered by their franchise uh, obligations for cable just is not turning out, they're not, they're not meeting that, that commitment, and they don't want to wait long years for it. Uh, is this true in many parts of the country, Mr. Malone? Uh, no, sir. I think that by and large, since the Cable Act, uh, I know in our company's case, areas that were not economically viable to construct historically are now uh, being constructed fairly aggressively, particularly uh, low-income urban areas, things of that nature. Um, basically, a franchise between a local community and a cable company is a contract, and you would think that the city, uh, if they're, you know, if the contract's being violated, would have recourse to uh, direct uh, remedies. I'm going to ask unanimous consent that I put this letter into the record, and that I'll get you a copy of it, Mr. Malone. I'd like to get a, a response without objection. To sure. The now that is not one of our uh, properties. So. Okay. Thank you. Here's the letter. Okay. Mr. Valenti, uh, is it realistically possible for cable to deal with programmers without a compulsory license, and if so, how? Cable deals with programmers without compulsory licenses today. The compulsory license gives the cable system the right to bring in a distant broadcast television signal without negotiating for the copyright owners. Uh, and the answer is that... Uh, it's very simple to do that. As a matter of fact, every television station, a couple of thousand television stations in the country, 
uh, deal without a compulsory license every day, Mr. Congressman. They, 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 they license programs from, uh, from programmers, not necessarily just the people I represent. There are hundreds of programmers that I don't represent who do a lot of business in the marketplace so that a cable system can do precisely what a television station does, and that is to program its 24-hour offerings to the public by going out and licensing programs. I'd say today that three, four, five distant signals is what an average cable system carries, but they've got 36 channels and they're negotiating for those programs, sometimes with themselves, and, but nonetheless they're negotiating. On the other side of that, Mr. Turner, is it possible for cable operators to negotiate with copyright holders individually in the event that Congress abolishes the compulsory license? It'd be very, very difficult, sir, as far as di distant stations would, uh, would disappear. This would mean that uh, the Los Angeles stations so, could no longer go into Bakersfield and Sacramento and, and so forth. So people have been watching the Angels and Dodgers games uh, and getting the news from L.A. would be disenfranchised. That, those, those stations would go. There would be, there is other programming. There's C-SPAN and... And, uh, and, and Cable News Network and a lot of the other programs would be there, but, but distant stations, which people have been enjoying, particularly in the smaller communities outside of the, of the major cities, would have poorer television service than, uh, than the people in the, in the larger cities. That's, that's what would happen. Mr. Malone? Yeah, I, I think that the real problem in just phasing out the compulsory license is uh, traditional viewership patterns and underserved markets. So that I think that if it was just phased out, uh, there would be a major outcry without a redefinition of what is local. In other words, one would have to redefine local signal to include these traditional regional viewership patterns. Otherwise, uh, all hell would break loose. Mr. Valenti, in your testimony, you bemoan the increase in the number of cable program services in which large MSOs own an equity interest. Tell us, what's so bad about these business relationships? Isn't it a good thing that cable operators are putting more money into more diverse programming? Well, the problem is conflict of interest, uh, Mr. Congressman, uh, that if three programmers are offering a program to a cable system, and, and the fourth program is one that they own, I think it's only human nature, no matter what protestations come from people, to sort of want to have your own program on your, your cable system because uh, you can make money out of it. That's why you own a piece of it. I think it has a way of, uh, of closing the gate, closing the entry points to independents who might have innovative programming but have no way of getting on because they have to give up a piece of the equity. I just read off one reason why NBC is probably offering 49% equity to cable operators is to make sure that if they could sell that to the top five cable operators, they'd be on half the cable systems in America. Half the subscribers would be seeing their program. So that's one way to get on. Uh, I, I just think conflict of interest, whether it's in business or in the Congress or, or in, in any other enterprise, uh, ought to be uh, abhorred. This time the gentleman has expired. The chair recognizes itself for five minutes. Uh, I just don't think we're dealing with good guys and bad guys here, uh, all the evidence to the contrary notwithstanding. I do remember, however, ten years ago <laughs> suggesting to the cable industry that they were going to get caught playing Baby Huey. Remember Baby Huey? He was the six-foot duck that wandered around in a diaper in the cartoons that people were going to catch on. And then I remember when we had the financial interest issue that that Jack was extremely successful in painting the images of the steely-eyed, greedy people in New York versus the starving artists in the garrets of Hollywood where they were, <laughs> where they were turning out only high-quality creative programs uh, of social commentary and uh, intellectual importance. Uh, I'm weeping. The, I'm weeping. <laughs> the, uh, well, Aaron Spelling uh, comes to mind as yeah. a practitioner of that. <laughs> and. Uh, the broadcasters have demonstrated their commitment to localism and public service by trying to have all the rules and regulations that require it abolished. So we're not, you know, obviously you're all good guys, right? What really is more important is how, how are we going to make all of this work best for the consumer? And I want to uh, address one issue, and I, it, this would not solve all the problems that we have here today. It might solve some. 
What I'm looking for is whether you think this idea would be helpful from the individual perspectives that you have. And that is, if you let telephone companies in their own markets into this as a common carrier only, not being able to own or provide programming, but simply carry programming for, uh, for any other program provider that wished to, uh, to buy their service. Mr. Malone, to start with you, you've indicated you've got no problem with them doing it outside of their service area. What, what do you see as the problems of doing it inside their service area? Well, I think the problem in their service area is basically it's very difficult to figure out uh, what their economic incentive is to do so, unless it's, it's uh, um, a quite One profitable business they'd like for them. the use of their optic fiber optics to be used more. Uh, they don't have any fiber optics, and it's going to be many years before they actually do into the well, home. We're going to be wrestling with these problems for many years. You've right. got to look down the line. Uh, I, I think, I think that, there's, that clear, there's clear motivation for a telephone company to want its wires used. The, you, should, you should understand that the industry's experience with the telephone company has been bad. We used to lease facilities from the phone company. In fact, when I got into the business, uh, I ran the major manufacturer in the industry, Gerald. General Instruments, and uh, uh, the Bell System was actually our largest single customer. They would buy stuff from us and lease it to cable companies. That experience was very bad. And I, and I understand that, and you were not the only person or, or entity that had trouble with the phone system. But a lot of things have changed there, too, over the years. They're no longer a monopoly. They're broken up. We're dealing all the time with trying to figure out how, whether you use the term open architecture or what have you, to, uh, to assure that you don't have cross-subsidization. Not only for you, but for a lot of other entities right. that want to use the system. So I know you had rotten experience with the phone company. They're another one of the good guys, right? Um, but things are changed, and we're dealing all the time with trying to develop policies whereby they can, they can not predatory, yeah. it'd be predators on other kinds of services. So I'm talking about that kind of a climate. What would be wrong with letting them do that? Well, the problem is if you guess wrong, then you really will have a monopoly. Uh, and there'll only be one provider. And, and well, if uh, we never did anything up here because we might guess wrong, we wouldn't do anything up <laughs> here. And we do guess wrong sometimes, but yeah. often we don't. What I'm getting at is, is we had uh, Jim Mooney before us before, and, and you alluded to the same thing today. One of the solutions, you say, is bring in another cable operator. That's difficult to do pragmatically today. Right. I think you'd agree with that. I, I think what... It, what, but what the, the point is, it's not going to be in the future difficult mm -hmm. to do at all. And I'm just trying to take okay. you both up on, uh, I think on you're, your bet. You're really wrestling with a situation that's evolving quite rapidly. Technology is changing, the business structures are changing, and cable penetration is changing. And you're either going to end up with cable being a regulated monopoly at some point Okay, or there will be other technologies which will be effective competitors and you won't have to wrestle with that issue. And I think the problem is that we're all trying to prejudge where you're going to end up. And I think if you let technology run a while, that answer will become quite clear. That's, that's my own opinion. And I think you've built that in with the FCC's authority to re-regulate cable if they determine that the, uh, that the marketplace is no longer competitive on a market-by-market market or national basis. Yeah, the chair's time is up, but I would suggest that's what I'm trying to do, is look down the line, see where the technology is going, and see if this wouldn't solve some of the problems, though clearly not all of the problems that we've been discussing. A uh, gentleman recognizes uh, the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Nielsen, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have several questions. First question I'll uh, ask just to Mr. Malone, Dr. Malone. The first cable uh, program, Mr. Mooney was here and I asked him about the situation in Channel 30 in Ogden, Utah and uh, the relationship with the, between you and them. I related how that they had been an old movie channel and they'd also then been a, a home uh, shopping, shopping channel and you had turned them down in both cases and brought in some similar ones in your own. Uh, would you please recite why you did that and why you now have repented? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, my, my understanding of the situation, this would be KOOG, which was licensed to Ogden, Utah, right. a UHF station. They received a license, began broadcasting, and requested carriage. 
and we, right. we carried them as quickly as we could in Ogden, Utah. We, we had to drop a signal in order to do that. We dropped WGN out of Chicago, which was a rather unpopular local move. They requested expanded carriage into Salt Lake. Uh, and and they we'd like it in Provo also. Pardon? And we'd like it in Provo and also. And in Provo also. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, there were two problems. First of all, they requested VHF carriage, which we didn't think was appropriate. Second of all, we could not receive their signal at our head ends uh, with adequate quality. They subsequently built a translator mm -hmm. and we put them on. But there was another issue which I think points out a little of the difficulty we have in dealing with federal regulation, is that there was a very real conflict in the minds of our attorneys between the copyright rules and the must carry rules. And that our carriage of that signal in the Salt Lake and Provo systems would expose us to very large copyright costs. Okay, we went back to the station and asked for an indemnity because the station didn't agree with that position. When they finally agreed that they would hold us harmless if we were, if we were right and they were wrong, we were able to put them on. Now, I can understand why you would have difficulty carrying a local station whether in a city like New York or Washington where there are many, many channels. In Utah, we have just three network channels, two independents, and two uh, public broadcasting. I mean, you had lots of places you could have put them without in injuring any of the other carriage. And I just wonder why you uh, substituted for them your own home shopping channel, your own old movie channel, instead of taking one that was already there extant. Well, we really didn't substitute for them those signals. In you other words, when we put them on, we substitute them for WGN out of Chicago. Uh, the other issue is, in our experience, people would really rather watch old movies without commercials than old movies with commercials. According so, to these, and that was, a, that was a major... Uh, according to the Association of Independent Television Stations, they would dispute that, but I'll talk to you more about that later. And I do appreciate your having moved lately on, on that issue. Certainly. Uh, let me ask you a question. At the cable, national cable uh, program we had in Los Angeles recently, the, meth the uh, telco bill was brought up, which I'm a sponsor. And Mr. Renaldo referred to it there. At that point, the cable people there say telephone can be so big and so all pervasive that they would eat us up alive. That's what he said. Uh, do you really think that's true? Do you think the cable people are so weak that they couldn't defend themselves against a well-regulated uh, telephone uh, network? Well, I think what we're really concerned about is this whole issue of cross-subsidy. And I guess one of the reverse questions is if you let them come and plow our fields, are you going to let us go and plow their fields? I.e., would you open it up so that we could provide telephone service? I, I would certainly support data, data transmission, if that's what you're concerned no, about. No, I'm talking about voice uh, communications. I mean... Well, I, I like to see a lot of competition. And we would ways. agree to allow you to regulate us to make sure we didn't cross-subsidize that service. I'm not the telephone company. I'm just simply saying... We need more competition. That's been mentioned by several of the panelists today. Right. Mr. Valenti also mentioned it. Uh, you can't get a second cable in there. Why, why wouldn't it be possible to have a system such as REA or a telephone company to go to the rural areas, which you don't want to go to anyway? Why wouldn't it be possible to have them uh, provide a service in those areas? Oh, I think that they can get waivers today. And, and uh, you know, we haven't opposed waivers for them to provide service where, where we can't economically what about the service. What about the city of Cerritos, California, where the, they wanted you to pr provide service and you declined, and then they had to go to a combination of uh, GTE and, uh, and cable to get the service they wanted? Well, if, if it had been my company that had been asked, we don't service that area of the country, but had we been in that area, we would have uh, provided the service. But as far as the industry is concerned, the industry felt that the city was basically putting out an RFP which was not economically viable. Uh, and I think that's why most people didn't bid. It wasn't the fact that GTE was getting in the business a little too uh, obtrusively. It wasn't, that wasn't the reason. Well, that's why the bid was, uh, was so aggressive, I think, is that there was a feeling that, that somebody was prepared to make an uneconomic investment there to prove some point. Let me ask uh, anyone, Mr. Turner, anyone else, as a way to effectuate must-carry objectives, a number of members of Congress have suggested tying must-carry rules to other provisions of the Cable Act. Mr. Rinaldo, for example, has suggested compliance with must-carry rules be a quid pro quo for rate deregulation. Mr. Bryant suggested must-carry be the quid pro quo for use of compulsory license. Would any of you like to comment on these uh, trade-offs? Are they viable? Are they reasonable? Our time they? is expired, but uh, the witnesses <coughs> may respond. Did you get your question out altogether? I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Yes, I, the question is, 
Would any like to comment on tying must carry to either the uh, rate re regulation, rate deregulation, or the compulsory license? Okay. I'll be happy to to answer that. I, I don't think so. I, I don't think that uh, that the issues are are related. Myself and the courts found that they weren't too. You're not ready to trade off something you've already won. Is what you're saying? Well, I mean, you know, I I'll trade uh, I'll trade as long as I'm getting something. You know, I mean, we get trade. What do we, I I. I I don't really have a problem with, 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 with broadcast stations being carried. I just want to be treated the same way that the broadcasters are. I think CNN and C-SPAN should be operating under the same, black entertainment television ought to be under the same rules that CBS, NBC, and ABC are. I think they're finer services under, under this committee regulating news and public affairs take precedence over entertainment. But under must carry rules, entertainment stations were given priority over uh, uh, cable networks that were that were minority or or any other uh, any other format. I just thought I thought that was wrong. Time the gentleman has expired. Uh, Mr. Cooper, for five minutes. Mr. Malone, I represent a very rural district in Tennessee, and of my 91,000 television households, about 24,000 receive cable. The rest are probably going to be ineligible for cable forever because of the low population density per mile. So I have about 67,000 non-cable customers. For that reason, I've co-sponsored the Tozan bill. Uh, for that reason, I would like to ask you whether my constituents are correct in, at best, being deeply suspicious that you have done nothing whatsoever to help the 67,000 people in my district and districts like mine, and at worst, that you have actively harmed their interests. In fact, many of my constituents kind of see you as the Darth Vader fighting against rural TV reception. I understand and that I'm, I'm indebted to Senator Gore for that title. Mm -hmm. But uh, in reality, uh, we believe very strongly that the DBS industry should, should uh, exist and should provide service to these people on a very cost-effective basis. I believe now there are a lot of uh, non-cable involved packagers uh, we ourselves are an investor in a thing called Netlink, which is a packager and supplier. Its rates are, uh, I believe, uh, substantially lower than those available to cable customers. Uh, we quite simply have never been able to get the rights from the programmers. The programmers basically wanted to hold those rights because they saw that as a business opportunity for them to be in the retail business of selling direct to those earth station owners. And they would not grant us or anybody else those rights. To the degree that we have the rights, we offer the services uh, in the areas around our cable systems, uh, I think, uh, at, at probably the lowest package prices uh, available. So I, I think they're wrong. We, we have tried very hard to uh, make that programming available. And um, that's, that's all I can really say. So are you saying that you have done nothing yourself to discriminate in any way against rural TV viewers? That's correct. In fact, we, we have a, a program to, uh, to wire wherever we can in low-density areas, even though it's a break-even uh, economic proposition. And, uh, you know, it's very important to our whole industry, our programmers and our cable operators, that rural America participate in this broadening of television viewership. It adds revenues to Mr. Turner and, and enables him to buy better programming, and that's what drives the whole economic machine. Mr. Rowland, have you or your firm had any communications with programmers that you own or with other programmers that you do business with on the question of whether the programming they produce should or should not be available to non-cable distributors? We uh, basically take the position both with the ones we have a small interest in, we don't control any, and those that we uh, uh, don't have a position in, that their programming should be made available to these packagers on a, uh, a fair and reasonable basis. So uh, you have had communications concerning non-cable distribution of... Sure. And we do through Netlink because we are in ourselves a packager and we try and get the rights and, uh, and make them available. So. And you have encouraged every programming company that you have an interest in to make those programs freely available to other distributors? Correct. 
Now, when you say other distributors, I have to say that we always put the caveat that adequate security me measures be uh, taken <coughs> because the industry has been badly hurt by theft of service in other distribution technologies. Mm -hmm. STV, for instance, theft of service with STV kept the cable industry in the LA market uh, uh, under the gun for years and years and years. And we really don't want to see that replicated. And I think that is a big concern of ours, that when you have descrambling uh, with no audit capability, uh, you run the risk of severe piracy and breaking down the whole system of collection and payment. I noticed that you used to be affiliated with the General Instruments Company. Are you concerned that General Instruments has a de facto monopoly in the manufacture of descramblers and um, they refuse to state any willingness to have Congress set a technical standard for descramblers so that customers can have some certainty when they shell out the $300, a price which, by the way, has not gone down? Are you well, concerned about that situation? We're very concerned, and in fact, at the point that, uh, that the whole scrambling issue, w when we as a customer had to decide to buy these scramblers for our cable head ends, we received assurances from General Instrument that they would sub-license that descrambling technology to any creditable uh, manufacturer and supplier. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we're concerned because we'd like to see those costs come down. We really want to see the folks out there, I might tell you that I can't get cable where I live. Okay, I've got an earth station in my summer home and I've got an earth station at, uh, in suburban Denver. And I pay for my programming. I live a block from here, I can't get cable at my house either. Time but of the gentleman you, has expired. If I could just ask for one clarification. Yep. Did you admit then that there is a de facto monopoly in the manufacture of descrambling devices by general instruments? As I th recall well, now, there's only one licensee, only one company in America yeah. eligible. I think almost so. de facto, when you have a patent, you have a, a monopoly, but then your willingness to license that is what, under public policy, I guess, determines fair access. But sure, we're concerned that that's in, in too tight uh, a manufacturing situation. My time has expired. Thank you. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Lynn. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Perhaps it ought to be noted, in fairness to the cable industry, that uh, the gentleman from uh, Tennessee's failure to get uh, cable in uh, Washington, D.C. can hardly be blamed on the cable industry. I think it more the fault, if any, more lies with the city council and the mayor here in the uh, city of Washington, D.C. Uh, Mr. Malone, the courts have uh, at least twice knocked out the must-carry rules on uh, constitutional grounds, but they've left in the A-B switch. Uh, Mr. Malone, the courts have uh, at least twice knocked out the must-carry rules on uh, constitutional grounds, but they've left in the A-B switch uh, requirement. In your view, is the A-B switch and the consumer education requirement imposed by the FCC and uh, upheld in the federal courts adequate to ensure that uh, broadcasting can compete effectively with cable? Uh, in, in my opinion, uh, no, it isn't. And it's not very practical either. Um. Why would not that be practical? You're talking about another device, another bunch of wires hanging on the back of the TV set. It's it's just not a not an attractive. Uh, it's it's not a uh, an elegant solution, as we might say in mathematics. It's, you know, it, it's kind of okay. awkward. Um, uh, Mr. Valeni, uh, you said that cable is a monopoly, and cable says in response that it it faces uh, great competition from off-air broadcasting and from VCRs to name two sources. Does uh, off-air broadcasting, in your opinion, provide effective competition to cable t television? And if not, why not? The answer is no. And the long answer is that you're talking about what the FCC says, if you can have three television signals in a community, that's effective competition. Uh, you know, that goes along with former Chairman Fowler saying that uh, 
programs are like just another toaster, uh, and it doesn't make any sense. Uh, effective competition <laughs> is for multi-channel uh, broadband video services. If you can get 36 channels in your home or 54, uh, and you can only get three or four off cable, I don't think you need to be a PhD in anything to understand that's not effective competition. Well, these uh, A-B switch rules that are put in place by the FCC offer the consumer a choice of whether or not he wants to uh, receive program signals from two different sources. <coughs> Isn't this enough protection for broadcasters? Well, I think the A-B switch, as Dr. Malone pointed out, in the real world, it just doesn't work. Okay. It, uh, if you're sitting there with a remote control unit and you're flipping through 36 channels, but uh, if you want to get something that's not on your cable system, you've got to get up and go turn a switch and come back, and then you've got to turn another switch. And in, in the real world of, of comfortable living, that old dog won't hunt. Well, in other words, there's something about the A-B switch. It, you could not uh, hook it up to the remote control? Well, I, I'm not a technician, and I'll have to leave others to know whether or not it, uh, you can hook it up to a remote. I don't believe you can, no. but uh, I'm not certain of it, Mr. Congressman. Well, uh, we're turning our attention now to these uh, video cassette rentals. Are not they, in fact, great competition for cable since VCRs are in nearly as many homes as is cable? And uh, if not, can you uh, provide us with any statistics? on the uh, number of uh, home movies that are being watched in this country today? Well, first, as competition, a VCR is competition for movies that you see on television. It is not competition for a special sitcom or news or whatever else that you're watching on television. Uh, we estimate, I think, that the average uh, home watches about seven hours and 40 minutes a day on television. Uh, our latest uh, surveys show about five and a half hours a week is used for either playback of something you taped off of television or to watch a movie, uh, which means that the largest part of one's time in a home is spent watching the television rather than playing back either a pre-recorded cassette or a program that you have taped. Uh, by any, any gauge you choose to employ, Mr. Lent, I cannot uh, for one moment imagine the VCR as a competitor uh, for, uh, for cable. It is an, a supplemental source of viewing, but that's as far as one can take it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further questions. Thank you, Chairman. The uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, was not here to hear the uh, presentation of, of this very distinguished panel, and I'll be very limiting in my question. I, uh, not unlike the gentleman from Tennessee, a lot of my constituents are TVRO owners, and I think they're a little concerned that they're not getting a fair shake out of the cable industry. Uh, to Mr. Turner, I direct this. I, I recall that you're directly marketing uh, CNN and WTBS to dish owners. That's correct, isn't it? Uh, CNN, I would like to have been able to uh, do that with uh, WTBS, but we weren't allowed to under the crazy rules of the compulsory uh, license. But we do, it, that, it's being done uh, by, by others, but we do, do, do market CNN and Headline News to the, to the, uh, to the, to the Tyro market. What uh, what success uh, do you feel, and, and why do you think that the other programmers have been reluctant, if they have been, and we view that they have been, reluctant to sell their services to dish owners? Well, we, we, we have never been uh, anything but totally supportive of doing that. In fact, uh, like Mr. Malone, I live uh, outside of a, of, of, of a cable area, and I have uh, home satellite receivers myself. In fact, I have seven of them at seven different places. And I also want, I have the first one that there ever was. And I put it up before there was even a, a way to get permits for them here 
the FCC. And I said the AB switch works just fine because that's how I get the local. You do have to get up to turn it. But in the old days, you had to get up to turn your television set. That's the only exercise that most of these cast potatoes ever get. There's nothing wrong with walking over there and turning the switch with your hand. In fact, all these damn uh, clickers and everything, I got so many of them because you got to have one for your VCR, one for your satellite receiver, one for your television set. I get so mixed up, Bob, it's complicated, as you know, if you've got a tyro. But we've got 300,000 people paying us and 300,000 more that, are, that, that have got chips uh, that, uh, that they're getting it for free. And I've been checking into that. There's a tremendous amount of piracy with these new, new signals. So nobody has to buy the services anymore. They can, they can get them for free if they just get the chip. It only costs a couple hundred bucks to get it. Free enterprises bringing that cost is coming down because it's, it's illegal. It's almost as big a problem as drugs, Congressman. If the gentleman would sus suspend for just a moment, the chair would announce that, that what we're going to try to do is to complete the questioning of this panel prior to this vote. The gentleman from Texas has three more minutes. The gentleman from Louisiana is the only other person. Then we will do the vote and come back and start the next panel. Just to uh, panel. finish that, it, 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 I have no problem getting any services that I want uh, as, a, as a Tyro owner. I don't know of a single service that's not available to, uh, to uh, home satellite receivers. Okay, the gentleman from Texas <laughs> has three additional minutes. Well, I, uh, I just think that they are upset. Uh, I have a district where we have folks uh, so far out that when you scramble them, all they have to do is go back to watching radio and uh, they don't exactly like that. I'm sure Congressman Tawson from Louisiana will have other questions to ask along this line. I certainly support his bill and one of the co-sponsors of his bill, but I believe, as most members of this Congress believe, that there's a reasonable and sensible figure there to where those of you who invest and provide jobs and technology can, can benefit and uh, still reach the people that have uh, bet their future on purchasing uh, a dish and have found the rules changed. Whether it's equitable to change them, fair to change them, uh, is not really the question. The fact is that they are changed and that we'd look to the, to the very uh, great amount of knowledge that sits at this table here to help us to solve that problem. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you, General Protectors. Recognize the gentleman from Louisiana for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I too, am impressed by the, uh, the colorful nature of this panel. I'm I should say up front that there are no couch potatoes here uh, today. You guys have been active and busy in this industry. Uh, I'm also impressed by the humility expressed by some of you, particularly Mr. Malone. Uh, when you say that you have a small interest in programmers, uh, I'm looking at a list of the telecommunications incorporated interest in programming investments. The smallest interest you have is a 12.5% interest uh, in uh, Think Entertainment. You have a 50% American movie classics, 50% in black entertainment, uh, 14 in Discovery, 14 in, uh, in Comp CVN, and uh, 15 in Turner Broadcasting. In fact, uh, Mr. Turner, you stated recently that TCI had a de facto control over Turner Broadcasting. That was Turner talking TNT Broadcasting, February 29, 1988, on page 40. Uh, that's, that's pretty substantial. That's not a tiny interest in programming, is it, Mr. Malone? Well, there are some errors in those. Uh, first of all, we don't own half of BET. We own one-sixth. And uh, second of all, I believe in, uh, in Turner, what you have to understand is that uh, our interest is uh, in stock that only votes one-tenth of a vote per share compared to Mr. Turner's that votes 10 votes. So we have 1.5% of the votes. Uh, we really did go into that to leave Mr. Turner in control and to avoid him having to make a deal with an existing network. Uh, yeah. Well, but Mr. Turner described it as de facto control. <laughs> Mr. I Turner, you might want to comment on that, please. Uh, I've been known for uh, taking large risks and uh, getting into, into big debt, kind of like the federal government. <laughs> and, and I owe a billion and a half dollars. And one of the things that the, the cable operators uh, wanted to have was uh, 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 be able to uh, have, I couldn't spend over $2 million without getting their approval as a supermajority issue. And I agreed to that because I was really kind of skitting on the edge uh, anyway, and another deal like the last one I made would have would have buried me for sure. It's trying to compete with the big boys. Uh, ABC, CBS, and NBC has, uh, those of you that have run against a better <coughs> finance style, uh, somebody with a lot more money in the campaign, because they're ten times as big as I am. I just 
But th that's what I meant by that, because they do have some control over the purse. I might strength. point out for the record that the numbers I cited are not mine, Mr. Malone. They're from your own testimony. Uh, so if they're in error, well, then... We've already supplied an errata sheet on those. Uh, secondly, uh, the one thing we've noticed is that since uh, TCI has gotten into programming, uh, there have been more and more decisions by programmers in which you're invested to offer their programming only to cable. That's just a phenomenon. Is that a coincidence or is that some relationship between the cross-ownership problem? Well, when you say only to cable, which, which ones would you refer to? Well, uh, TNT has gone uh, uh, cable exclusive, I think, since you've gotten an interest in it. Yeah, but that's only in cabled areas. In other words, the service will be available outside cabled areas to uh, TVRO. Owners. Well, let's talk about the cable areas only. Um, you're the, um, many of the areas of the country, TCI is the sole retailer, the basic cable package sold to consumers. I think uh, there are about 8 million people who subscribe to TCI cable services that have no practical way to purchase the uh, basic package anywhere else. Uh, what's stopping other competitors from taking you on head to head in the cable areas if it didn't decisions uh, to limit uh, program sales only to, to cable. Well, of course, all of the basic channels now are available by TVRO in our cable areas and outside. All you have to do is call HBO or, or Viacom or, mm -hmm. uh, or any of the 20 other packages. Right. So you do have access that way. With respect to the, the uniqueness of TNT, uh, Ted has asked us for a very large financial commitment up front in order to get TNT up and going, and we felt it was appropriate for us to have at least a reasonable time during which we would have exclusivity to exploit that particular service in our markets uh, to recover our investment. Simple as that. Spruik, you were um, uh, with uh, Viacom International until last year, I believe. When you were there, did you or your representatives have any communications with other programmers regarding whether programming should be made available to competitors of cable? Not that I'm aware of. I don't, I don't think so. The, uh, the concern expressed uh, just in the last conversation about the, uh, about the problem of descrambling and scrambling being as bad a problem as drug smuggling, uh, Mr. Turner, is, uh, is I think uh, verified in the figures we receive from the cable industry. They estimate 850,000 MACOM decoders out there. 100,000 of which are identified on the shelf still. 350,000 are authorized, and that leaves 400,000 operating somewhere unauthorized. And that tells me the whole system is falling apart. When over half of the people that are uh, descrambling services, uh, which, uh, which we're all trying to bring some order to, are getting it uh, in, a, in a pirated fashion. Uh, what are we going to do about it if we don't pass legislation? to give the FCC some authority to set standards in decoding and, and uh, encryption and set some standards in marketing. I, uh, I'm not a technical, uh, technical person, Congressman, and uh, nobody's more upset than, than us because of that 350,000 that are authorized, almost 85%, uh, we have 300,000 roughly uh, subscribing to CNN, more than, uh, more than any other service. And, and it's costing us millions of dollars for those other 300,000 or so well, that, uh, that aren't paying us. I, I hear that from everyone now. Cable interest, TVRO interest, those of you who are programmers who have an interest in getting paid for those services, everybody is saying the system is not working. Uh, and what I'm asking, I suppose, is why don't we all come together with legislation that establishes some standards and establishes in the FCC some authority over an industry that literally is falling apart if we don't order, order the market somewhere rather than constantly fight over how that packaging should occur as we, we're currently <laughs> doing. It seems to me it's time for us to come together in the bill that we're trying to offer and, and trying okay, to bring as long as we could have uh, opportunity to, to set our own prices and not have them set by uh, the government, you know, that's... Would well, it be fair to say that the prices should be non-discriminatory in the marketplace? Uh, depending, on, depending on the situation. Depending on the situation. I mean, obviously a wholesale price should be different than a retail price. Uh, uh, yes. Should the wholesale price be non-discriminatory? That is, to the same volume markets. Mm, I've got to, I'd have to give, you know, talk to, talk to my people about that, but I'll be happy to uh, get back to you on it. I think it's time for us to talk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time the gentleman has expired. The chair would like to make an announcement. First of all, we want to thank this panel. You've been extremely helpful. The committee appreciates it. Chairman Markey, 
wishes to express his regrets to you. He has an amendment on the floor to the Department of uh, Defense Authorization Bill and uh, could not be here uh, for the remainder of this morning's session. We are going to adjourn now and we will, uh, recess is a better word, we will reconvene with the second panel at 1.30. Well, the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Telecommunications Recesses will also take a short break and return with more of this hearing on cable television programming diversity in a few moments. The C-SPAN update can be helpful if you want to better plan your C-SPAN viewing. The update is the weekly newspaper of America's network and details many of the major events we cover. Call 1-800-321-5400 and for just $24 we'll start your subscription to the C-SPAN update. Order today, and we'll also send you a free gift, C-SPAN's Road to the White House poster. You can use your credit card, or we'll be glad to bill you. Call now. Heritage believes the purpose of cable television is to bring variety to people's homes, to the people who watch television. C-SPAN brings that kind of variety with the kind of programming that they can't get anywhere else. And we found uh, in state after state where we have cable systems that while the viewership may not be great, those who do watch C-SPAN love it and watch it time in and time out. C-SPAN, created and supported by the cable television industry to offer unique public affairs programming to the nation. C-SPAN is America's network. Next on C-SPAN, we return to our coverage of a hearing before the House Energy and Commerce Telecommunications Subcommittee on Cable Television Programming Diversity. Okay. We'll get underway. Other members will surely be here in a moment. I think uh, <coughs> that they've retired to witness the signing of uh, a match between Ted Turner and Jack Valenti on the Spinks Tyson uh, match. They're going to fight under 10 there. I might say to Mr. Turner that a lot of people have jumped on Jack Valenti because he's small that are retired now. <laughs> we have a very fine uh, group again here and we're honored to have you. We have men on the panel who are people that I've admired for a long time, some that I have great personal uh, friendship for and uh, one of the first is William B. Strange Jr. who is chairman of Beta Communications uh, who served my little hometown and of course I knew Bill Strange when he was mayor of one of the fastest growing cities in America and I know of his other many accomplishments. Uh, we have uh, Stephen Ifros, president of Community Antenna Television Association of Fairfax, and we're happy, of course, to have you. We have Edward O. Eddie Fritz, president of the National Association of Broadcasters. I don't guess that anybody that doesn't know Ed, what a great job he does. Preston R. Padden, and Mr. Padden, we're happy to have you, president of the Association of Independent Television Stations and uh, David Brueger, who is president of the National Association of Public Television Stations. And oh, Mr. Brueger here? Yes. All right, and since you've lined up, uh, Mr. Brueger, on you on my far left, that means probably you get to go first. Is that, unless the panel has other wishes? That's fine. Suitable? All right, chair recognizes you, and you might uh, either Thank brief summarize your testimony and without objection it'll be put into the records other members will be here in a little while and if they aren't here I don't feel that your time's wasted because your testimony of course is being recorded and will be analyzed by all staff members and made available to the rest of Congress and of course the rest of this committee so uh, thanking all of you who are very busy and successful men for the time and and the uh, testimony that you'll give us let me recognize you Mr. Brugger. Thank you, Mr. Hall, and thank you for inviting us to the oversight hearing on cable television. 
Uh, it stated that the focus of this hearing was <coughs> increasing viewer and consumer choices in the video marketplace. It's also a very good statement of why the Congress supports and funds public television on behalf of nearly 100 million Americans who tune in to public television weekly. In the Public Broadcasting Act, Congress declares that it is in uh, the public interest to encourage the growth and development of public broadcasting, which will be responsive to the interests of the people, whether in local communities or throughout the nation, which will constitute an expression of diversity and excellence and which will constitute a source of alternative telecommunication services for all citizens of the nation. Public TV is doing just that. We cover 97% of this country with over 300 broadcast stations and through cable television. We exemplify public programming diversity by serving 23 million children in schools with instruction, by offering high school equivalency degrees and college credit courses. We produce quality news, public affairs documentaries, cultural and art programs, and we're committed to community outreach on drug abuse, illiteracy, teenage alcoholism, and child care, to name just a few. We also offer a full range of children's programming. Public TV led the way on closed captioning for the hearing impaired and on a new descriptive video service for the blind and vision impaired. The federal government's investment of around $3 billion since 1967 is a substantial interest in making sure that this diversity of service remains available to the American public. The introduction of cable has benefited public broadcasting. Many of our stations are handicapped by being on UHF frequencies, and cable gave some of our viewers their first clear picture of public TV. Our viewership actually increased in cable homes. Public TV and cable have much in common. Public TV viewers are 27% more likely to subscribe to cable than non-public TV viewers. 60% of all cable subscribers watch public TV each week. If our viewers can get more than one station on cable, 79% report watching more than one public TV station. As a matter of fact, two-thirds of cable subscribers say one of the reasons they subscribe to cable is for better reception of a PBS station or access to more than one public TV station. With a cable penetration rate of over 50% of TV households, a key factor in public TV's continued ability to meet Congress's mandate is cable carriage. Without cable carriage, it's going to be difficult for our audiences to have full access to public television. A loss of carriage can start a whole chain reaction. If we lose viewers, we lose the viewers' contributions, and that is now the largest single source of funds for public television. If they don't have those funds, they can't meet the matching funds that we need for other federal and non-federal funders. And so you have a downward spiral can occur. Even with carriage comes the related issues of channel positioning, compulsory license, and syndicated exclusivity. It doesn't matter whether our programs are broadcast, narrowcast, or even on cassette. These are difficult issues for public TV because our return on investment is the public interest, paid for to a great extent with tax dollars. Our concern here is assurance for the public's continued access to their programming, be it local, regional, or national in scope. We've been making efforts to work with cable to make them aware of how and why we're beneficial. We want cable operators to recognize our unique service. We're happy that Jim Mooney of NCTA has shown a willingness to work with us on our concerns. But we're also happy and applaud Congress's interest and support to make sure that there's a healthy public TV system and to watch the impact that cable may have on it. Thank you. Chair, recognize Mr. Padden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With your permission, we'll submit our <coughs> voluminous written materials for the record. Without objection, they will be put in the record. And I'd like to take this five minutes just to respond to some of the uh, discussion uh, that we heard on the first panel. Um, to begin with, our stations, we believe, make a contribution to the diversity of, of uh, information and entertainment programming available to the American people. We provide our programming to the American people for free. We think that's a critical distinction between our service and the service provided by the cable industry. Uh, we believe the people have demonstrated an interest in our programming because 23% of all television viewing today is to independent station programming. Unfortunately, our stations are in financial trouble. 
the present time, the, in 1987, the average independent station lost money, and there are currently 23 independent stations in bankruptcy. We believe that the marketplace forces that caused that uh, are beginning to abate. Program prices are coming down. But the difficulties we're having with the cable television industry are not making uh, the continued ability of our stations to serve the public any easier. I listened to Dr. Malone this morning, and I was certainly very impressed. Uh, he seemed like a very nice gentleman, and we want to give him the benefit of the doubt on his testimony. When we heard him talking about the passive nature of his programming investments, we kind of got this mental image of him sitting on the back porch in the rocking chair cutting coupons out. Uh, we don't think it, that's quite the way it is. And he's provided a letter to the uh, chairman responding to some of the written material we prepared in which he suggests that, that many of the cable difficulties we described never happened. And in particular, he talks about uh, the Ogden, Utah situation that Mr. <coughs> Nielsen referred to never happened. Well, certainly it happened. And the original investors in that station lost their investment and had to uh, give up the station to other investors because of the cable difficulties they encountered. And he particularly sat right here and said, after they put a translator on in Salt Lake City, we put them on the system. What he didn't tell you is they first fought at the FCC, had their lawyers filing papers saying, we don't think we have to put them on because of the translator. After they lost, after the FCC ruled against him, then they put him on. Is and that I, the reason I, you were flouncing around in your seat when that's, he was That's testifying? exactly the reason. And the same is true. I, you I thought maybe you had other problems. <laughs> You, you talk to the investors of the station up in Martha's Vineyard and tell them TCI says the problem never happened. They had to give the station back to the bank because after being on the air for two years, they couldn't get carried by more than a quarter of the cable systems in the area. So You feel kind of like I felt when a guy called me to make his bond for, they put it, they, he said, I'm being held for walking on the wrong side of the street. I said, they can't put you in jail for that. He said, lawyer, I'm calling from a jail. <laughs> That's, that's, exact, that's exactly what we feel like. We, like I said, we want to give Dr. Malone the benefit of the doubt, but he sits here and says that uh, these things never happen. Our members don't pay us to come up here and pursue fictitious problems. I have the same response to uh, some of the remarks I believe Mr. Efros is going to make. Dr. Malone also said the channel, channel shifting was just a one-time only thing. Hasn't happened anymore. Well, just this week we heard the Los Angeles independents, all of them VHF, are being shifted up to channels 31 through 34 on a local cable system. And I've got here a letter from a VHF station in St. Louis that was sent to Dr. Malone's number one lieutenant, J.C. Sparkman, in February complaining about being shifted out of the VHF band. He hasn't gotten a response to this yet. Now, we're perfectly happy to work with uh, the cable industry in a responsible manner, but we are at somewhat of a loss as to know how to respond when we f see the problems we're having in the field every day and they come here to Washington and tell you everything's just wonderful. He, re he responded to, to Mr. Eckert's question by saying that shift was a, quote, unfortunate error. Well, we're seeing those unfortunate errors in markets all across the country. Now, on the channel shifting issue, it's not simply a matter of us wanting uh, the low number channel numbers because they look nicer. In, in Dr. Malone's written testimony, it's, it's in there, he explains to you when they hook up cable in a home, they only, they, they only give them one converter box. They have to rent converter boxes for all the other sets in the home. And if they don't rent them and we've been shifted up to a higher channel number, we're not there. So in many cases, being shifted up is the same as being shifted out. We see time after time what gets put in our place are program services in which the owner of the conduit has an equity interest. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what's going on here. He takes our stations out of the good channel positions and he replaces us with program services in which he's got an equity investment. We're forced, in effect, to play against the house. And anybody that's ever been to Las Vegas knows that you can't win that way. The Wall Street Journal just last week had a quote that says the cable industry has extracted an equity interest in every successfully launched cable program service uh, in the last two years. And Mr. Chairman, unless something's done about the carriage and channel placement of local stations, the only alternative all local broadcasters may have is to give up equity interest to uh, Dr. Malone so that he can own all the broadcast stations in the country and then we might get 
uh, equal treatment with the cable program services that he owns. I'll give you one example. This happened in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Local UHF station carried in the VHF band tries to compete with the cable uh, in the sale of local advertising. They get an ugly letter from the cable operator saying, don't try to compete with our advertising anymore or we may have to resort to something like moving you up into the UHF band. We just can't do business like that. In 1974, the White House uh, study group on cable issued a report that we strongly urged this subcommittee's consideration in which they said that you've got to separate the ownership of these conduits from the ownership of the programming trying to get through them or else there's going to be terrible problems. And they had it nailed dead exactly right <coughs> in 1974. Mr. Turner sat here this morning and made an analogy to airline deregulation. The situation we've got is like airline deregulation with one airline owning all the airports. And you can imagine uh, the success the other airlines would have in getting takeoff and landing slots if one airline owned all the, the uh, airports. Dr. Malone talked about overbuilds always being a possibility. Just a month ago, his own general counsel gave a speech in which he said overbuilds are not viable. Uh, Mr. Coates talked about, is cable really a monopoly? I would refer him to the affidavit in our testimony of a woman who lives right in the middle of New York City who explains quite clearly that she has to rely on cable for her television service. She doesn't see any television that doesn't come down her cable wire. She doesn't have an alternative. Mr. Lent asked about the effective competition proceeding. Attached to our testimony, there is a uh, academic paper written by economists explaining why cable does not currently face effective competition. The program siphoning issue is perhaps the greatest threat consumers face. Cable making consumers pay to see programming the broadcasters have provided them for free. Mr. Turner says, well, it's a free country, but if you look at some of the things going on, some of the sports interests have an antitrust exemption that's not just a free country, and the cable industry enjoys a compulsory copyright license that is not just a free country. It's not that simple. And they talk about the consumer outcry from Syndex program deletions, I think when the general public figures out that they're going to be charged to pay the very same uh, charge to see the very same program events the broadcasters are providing them for free, there's going to be a political outcry that will make anything over Syndex look like uh, child's play. On Syndex, I think it was mentioned here earlier this morning, the cable industry wants exclusivity for their own program product. They scrambled all their satellite services and did great harm to consumers all across the country who were getting those services and on their home dishes. They weren't worried about consumer welfare when that happened. It's only when the local broadcaster starts being concerned about his program exclusivity that the cable folks suddenly become the champions of consumers. Um, our solutions that we have to offer you, we think uh, it's a pretty, pretty simple situation. If you don't want to just let uh, Dr. Malone own all of the TV stations, you could try and introduce competition uh, by telephone companies. We think there's a lot of problems attendant with that. Another alternative would be to take on a frontal assault on vertical integration. We think the most reasonable way to proceed is as suggested in legislation introduced by Mr. Bryant to adopt copyright linked must carry and channel shifting legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Patton. Uh, Mr. Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. I seem to have contracted a cold, and, and I will uh, do my best to <coughs> get through this. We do have a, a longer statement for the record we'd like to introduce, um, and I'd just like to summarize our remarks. It will be appreciated, and your entire testimony will be put in the record, uh, your prepared statement. Thank you very much. First, let me say that I'm pleased to hear that Dr. Malone of TCI and Ted Turner of Turner Broadcasting uh, would support the reimposition of a must carry rule by in law uh, for broadcast stations. I think that's a major thrust of our testimony uh, today, and I'm pleased to hear that uh, two men of their stature in the cable industry would, uh, would support that. Uh, let me preface our, my remarks by saying that uh, it's well known that we have had uh, a working relationship with um, uh, the NCTA and others in the cable industry uh, reaching out, attempting to reach compromise on many of these issues. Uh, and we would hope that uh, in, the, in the near future 
that uh, both of us could jointly approach uh, the Congress with some reasonable legislation, uh, which would uh, hopefully settle a lot of the problems. But as Mr. Padden pointed out, there are problems, and I think this hearing was called to discuss what happened since 1984 when the Cable Act uh, was enacted. Uh, as we understand it, it was enacted to develop uh, economic stability to help cable become a full-scale competitor in the video marketplace. Four years later, after the Cable Act, this uh, has succeeded in this goal many times over. Now, because of this, we think it's appropriate that the Cable Act be examined and re-looked at uh, and determine what developments have affected the public's ability to receive diverse video programming. Let me cite some uh, examples of how this law has helped cable. It created a climate in which cable advertising revenues have grown 301% in five years to more than $1.15 billion. It freed cable from most intrusions by local franchising authorities in the area of programming decisions. It provided cable franchisees with the presumption of renewal. It virtually eliminated the oversight of cable by the FCC and it enabled most cable systems to raise rates at will. It restructured the industry's entire financial base. In 1983, the average cable system sold for $988 per subscriber. Now, the going rate today is about $2,700 per subscriber. Per subscriber. Think of it in these terms. Uh, in 1983, a cable system with 20,000 subscribers would be worth roughly $20 million. Today, that system's worth $54 million. On top of all of these advantages, cable is the only game in town. Only about 35 cable systems nationwide <coughs> out of more than 7,000 have local competition. As a result of the Cable Act, the cable industry has become the mouse that roared. Since 1983, the number of subscribers has increased by 33% to some 45 million households. Since 1983, the average cable rate for basic subscriber service has increased 41%. Since 1983, cable subscriber revenues have risen 63% to $11.4 billion. And while all this was going on, the courts overturned must carry. Now this combined with the FCC's earlier elimination of syndicated exclusivity has so skewed the competitive market arena as to make a mockery of the term competitive marketplace. Today, cable is a powerful, essentially unregulated competitor with the ability to choose whether to carry a local broadcast signal on their assigned channels or not to carry them at all. And we have begun this year to collect statistics on stations which have been dropped by cable systems or shifted off channel, and we've discovered that it is happening all across the country. Information gathered in the last 90 days indicates <coughs> that cable systems have dropped 17 broadcast stations and repositioned 26 others. Cable is free to make these carriage decisions without regard to market forces unless they benefit the local cable operator. In other words, the incentive is for cable not to carry local broadcast stations that compete in the same market for advertising revenues. The result is that the concept of local community service embodied in Section 307B of the Communications Act is being undermined, that act which was set forth by this Congress. Our ability to provide news, local public affairs programming, to engage in public service campaigns, to provide uh, time for important community discussions are all sustained only by advertising revenues. We need to be assured that we can reach all of the local audience, not just that portion, for whatever reason, does not subscribe to cable television. Congress needs to decide whether local television broadcasters should be given a reasonable expectancy of carriage on local cable systems that operate in the same market. We're asking for a return to a marketplace that is competitive and equitable, a marketplace in which broadcasters have access to cable systems by must-carry rules, a marketplace where broadcasters have stability through rules prohibiting channel shifting, and a marketplace where broadcasters who buy exclusive rights to syndicated programming can have that exclusivity. Mr. Chairman, I think you know we do not shun competition. We hope the committee recognizes that the video marketplace of today is far different than it was in 1984. We would ask that this Congress consider restoring the balance and let the public, not necessarily the cable operator, make those choices. We look forward to working with you in restoring a competitive marketplace. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Fritz. Uh, if we'd hand the mic over to Mr. Strange, we recognize Mr. Strange at this time. Thank you. And we have a light set there for you, Bill. Let's get it. We've, no, we have the light here. It's green when you're on. and. Uh, 
we've retired the hook, but when red comes up okay. there, it means right. your time's up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. All right. I'm Bill Strange, and I'm chairman of Beta Communications. So we are called by Paul Kagan an IBM SO. That means an itty bitty MSO. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the smallest cable operator, I guess, that's ever graced this hearing table. And in that connection, I want to thank this committee and the chairman and the staff for affording me an opportunity to visit with you all. And I didn't prepare any speeches. I just want to visit with you for about five, eight minutes, and then I'll answer any questions. But as you live a lifetime, you never have an opportunity to visit with the folks that make the rules. And I thank you. And while we're talking about making the rules, I want to commend the committee for the Cable Act of 1984 in achieving what you set out to do. As I understand it, was to provide more program diversity and I'll recite the record for you in just a minute. I'd like to speak to the four or five areas. And my head's still swimming from Mr. Payton. I felt like he was hunting for a corner in a silo. But at any rate, uh, I'll get to those channel conversions in just a minute. The matter of must carry is a non-issue. We've agreed with the broadcasters we don't have anything against the must carry. We worked out a deal once. It's a non-issue for this committee to consider. I'd like to, to speak to about program diversity. That's one of your objectives. That's what you wrote a bill on. You've, you've pretty well created program diversity in America. So much so, you got programmers fighting. You got everybody uh, kind of stirred up. And when you follow a Ted Turner and Malone and and Jack Valenti, you got your work cut out. And I, and I certainly commend the committee for listening. What has Cable done? Maybe the reason most of them didn't come back. That's <laughs> <laughs> show was over, wasn't it? Uh, I'm interested in visiting with the committee on what the cable TV industry has done. Let's look at it for a minute. We occasionally get accused of not providing local input. And contained in nearly every franchise in America, we provide a soapbox known as public access, governmental access to local city councils, frequently the, the uh, county. We have school systems. In addition to that, we've provided children's programming. It wasn't too long ago that this was a wasteland out there. And it was through the Nickelodeon that we provided children's <coughs> programming, introduced the Discovery Channel, the MTV. We have arts and entertainment, and it's, all, it's pretty well available everywhere. Have you ever been to New York and watched the Chinese Channel? Well, we're, we're, we're facing up to, to and the black entertainment and the rest. We run as many charity programs as the local broadcasters do frequently more. We're accused of being an unregulated monopoly. My friend Mr. Valenti likes to say that. Now, I don't understand all the definition of monopoly, but a monopoly tells me you're serving everybody. <coughs> In the city of Fort Worth, Texas, they serve one out of three because the local broadcasters got so much television fare for them, they don't need the cable. In Dallas, Texas, they serve one out of four. So there's so much off-the-air television programming, both independent as well as network stations, UHF and VHF stations, that the people elect not to take the cable. In the city of Rockwall, Texas, that we serve, a very small community, but a lovely community, my partner, Jim Strange, said, Bill, we're running a, a, a radar channel. And we got the weather channel on there, and I'm going to take this radar channel off. It's going to save us hundreds of dollars a month. And I said, well, that sounds like a good business decision. He said, the weather channel's got radar channel in it, and does it many times a day. He took the radar channel off. At last account, we, uh, in about a week's time, we had 46 calls. We put that mother back on. <laughs> You Does that see, include the letters I forwarded on to you <laughs> that I got? 
Yes, sir, you got some. And telephone calls. The point I'm trying to make is that the consumer ends up being the forgotten person when you hear independent stations and cable stations go at one another. If you're providing diversity of programming and you're given the good pictures at a reasonable price, the folks like you. It's when you don't give the service either good pictures or attendance to serving them that you have the problem. Incidentally, before I forget it, call up and complain about your telephone and ask them to come out and check your phone. They'll come out and you'll get a bill. Call it, we get the cable, they call you cable operator, we don't charge. That's a part of that service, and the cable industry has never made that point. Mr. Payton makes the comment in his testimony to the effect that we're not able to serve the people that are in apartments and hotels because they have 12 channel systems available to them. Those folks ain't on the cable. We can't serve them. We're prohibited from serving them. Now, an apartment resident in this country of ours is a second-class citizen. You can call up and get telephone, but call up and try to get cable. You can't get it. They talk about us being a monopoly and not having competition. Mr. Valenti talks about being a monopoly. We haven't run the movie E.T. yet. Try to get it, and they talk about a monopoly. He thinks that the good offense is the best defense in this sort of thing. I don't understand it any other way. A few more points. Talk about competition. If they don't like the cable, they don't like what they're doing, they've got the price of dishes down now for $300. We got big ads running, quarter page ads in the Dallas Morning News this past Sunday for $399 will bring you 100 channels free. <coughs> now, and they say that we don't have any competition. Somebody's got to be watching that referee. We're getting the hell knocked out of us someplace because we're getting 25% service in Dallas, 33% in Fort Worth, about 50% in Minneapolis, 50% nationally, and all of a sudden we're a monopoly, an unregulated monopoly. I can't believe this committee would create an unregulated monopoly. You wrote an awful good bill, but you took out a right of entry. So we've had to go to the state legislatures, and one by one, we're getting right of entry. But start trying to deal with some of the apartment owners, you have a little bit of a problem. The last thing I want to comment concerns the telephone companies. They're probably going to end up in our business. They can get in our business right now. Anytime they want a cable business, they can go get in it. They're just prohibited from getting into an area that they serve because they say it's an unlevel playing field. <coughs> I appreciate your attention, and I appreciate you letting me visit with you on syndicated exclusivity and some of those other issues. I've got opinions. I'm occasionally wrong, but seldom in doubt. And I thank you very much. I don't know where they've been keeping you all this time. <laughs> when you put that uh, radar back, did you get any thank you letters? I got calls from everywhere. I didn't know the police force was looking at it. They sent a, a police car by and thanked us. You, you know I took credit for getting that put back, don't you? I'll be back. <laughs> oh, we recognize, recognize Mr. Afros. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the inclusion of my formal comments in the you do it now, record. I think we ought to get down to getting some perspective on this whole thing, as Bill was trying to do just a minute ago. We've been accused of a lot of things here in the last uh, couple of hours. Uh, the accusations are not new. Uh, indeed, I've been in this game since 1971, and the same question has been asked over and over uh, when I was at the FCC and they were originally writing the signal carriage rules. The question was raised to the broadcasters of why is it that we should give you these special privileges? What, what is it that that makes a broadcaster special. And of course, with the answer that came back then was, well, we have all sorts of public interest obligations that we have to uh, provide to the public. And as a consequence, so we are a resource that is absolutely essential. And I think Mr. Padden, in his comments, uh, his formal comments, called it of inestimable value to the American public. Well, as we all know, those requirements no longer exist in the main. As a, it's interesting, Mr. Fritz just said, 
he was talking about a powerful, essentially unregulated competitor. And I wonder whether we're talking about cable or broadcast here, because broadcasting, too, is a very powerful, basically unregulated competitor. So what is it, why, why is it that broadcast stations should be given these special privileges, whatever they are? Well, the answer that keeps coming back these days is localism. We provide local programming that the cable operator doesn't. I would suggest to this committee that a study be done of exactly what local programming the independent television stations in this country provide. Because we have heard this argument over and over and over again. It is about the sole justification left for special treatment of one competitor versus another competitor. And I'm here to submit to you, gentlemen, that it's not true. We tried to take, in the last 48 hours, the so-called horror stories that were presented <coughs> to you by Mr. Padden in his uh, large document and get some perspective on them. First thing you've got to do is get perspective on how many there really are. What are we talking about? Well, what we're talking about is 1,349 broadcast stations in the United States and 42 allegations of misdeeds by stations. That's what we're talking about. It's considerably less than 1%. Of those alleging misdeeds, by the way, only 12 were alleging non-carriage. And of the 12 that are alleging non-carriage, most of them are now carried. Now, am I here saying that the cable industry is perfect, that we have not made mistakes, that we haven't said some very stupid things? No. We have had major mistakes. We have had major errors. We have had some very undiplomatic things said in the heat of battle in local communities. And I would agree with Preston that there were problems, and there are going to be problems in the future. But a vast, vast majority of the broadcast stations in this country are carried. Indeed, I would challenge anybody to find any significant number of broadcast stations in this country today that are not carried based on the private agreement that was made between the broadcast and the cable industries prior to the last <coughs> efforts of the FCC to adopt a rule. We are complying with that agreement. We do not have a problem here that justifies legislation. Indeed, the interesting thing is the broadcasters have not been able to propose legislation because the legislation gets mixed up with something else, and that's signal carriage placement. You have never heard Mr. Padden specifically make a recommendation as to where the signals are supposed to be carried. The cable industry voluntarily <coughs> is now moving toward on-channel carriage. That is, wherever the FCC signal, uh, wherever the FCC designated a broadcast channel, to the degree possible, the cable industry is going to put the broadcast channel on that channel on their cable system. Indeed, if you look at the FCC rules in 1972 under the must-carry provisions, that's what we were told we were supposed to do. And who asked for that in the 72 rules? The broadcast industry asked for that. On-channel carriage, where possible. Now, we're putting them on-channel. What's happening? We're getting complaints. We're being told this is anti-competitive. Well, make a proposal, gentlemen. We don't care. We have said repeatedly that in most cases, cable is going to carry broadcasters. And we are. The evidence is there. The facts are there. The numbers are there. Yes, there are some that don't happen. There are a few horror stories. There is a station in Lawrence, Kansas, which is 24 hour a day, home shopping network. It is running at 40% of power. It went on the air in 1988. It is not being carried right now. That is true. There is no local programming on that channel. Indeed, if you will look at the testimony that I submitted, in the 48 hours we've had to try to digest this pound and a half document that was thrown at us, we have found that virtually every local independent station that was listed does not have any significant local programming. Now, if that's the case, why is it that that broadcaster should get special privilege? Yeah, time. Yep. I would suggest to you, even if there is no rationale, the broadcast industry is providing, I mean, the cable industry is providing that carriage, even without the localism. The problem here doesn't exist. And that's the problem we have today. We have a lot of people yelling about a problem that, in essence, does not exist. If you want to try to write legislation on must-carry, 
We are willing to cooperate with you on doing so. I do not believe we have seen any piece of legislation so far that would pass constitutional muster. And uh, we told the broadcast industry that in terms of the FCC effort uh, two years ago. But we were willing to reach a business solution to must carry, and we did, and we have been complying in the main with it. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, we do thank you. And Chair, I recognize Mr. Ritter, Pennsylvania, for five minutes or for whatever length of time that he well, might want since our equipment's and... not working here. <laughs> <laughs> Have to call out the I think mine's working, Mr. Chairman, so we'll set it up. Uh, I think we've had some very interesting testimony. And uh, how, I, in response to Mr. Efros's comments, uh, maybe Mr. Fritz and Mr. Padden could uh, enumerate how they might wish to strengthen either the localism component of their arguments, which have not worked well thus far in the in the courts or how they might wish to strengthen uh, legislatively to pass court muster uh, the concept of must carry uh, sure I'd be glad to uh, respond to that I said in my testimony I maybe Steve missed it that we support the approach embodied in the bill introduced by mr. Bryant it uh, attempts to uh, craft must carry and channel shifting legislation that is tied to the extraordinary privilege of the compulsory copyright license. What the bill says is not you must carry with a capital M and a capital C. It says if you want the continued privilege of a compulsory copyright license to carry all the local broadcasters virtually for free, then we'd like you to use it in a non-discriminatory way and carry all of them. We think that would immeasurably boost the constitutional standing of must carry in court the next time. The bill also, and I said we support this bill, the bill has a very clear approach to the question of channel shifting. It would direct the cable people to put our stations back where they were before they started shuffling the traffic to feather the nest of their own investments. It's a very simple approach. Uh, I don't know what Steve's talking about when he says we don't, we don't have an approach that we know. As far as localism and Everybody's getting carried. I mean, if you listen to Steve, all the stations are getting carried. Nobody's doing any local programming. As we sit here, WLIG, the only commercial television station on Long Island, is running a daily local Long Island newscast. It's the only over-the-air source of Long Island television news, and it's not being carried by the biggest cable operator on Long Island because he's got his own cable news channel about <coughs> Long Island, and he doesn't want the competition. Interesting. Let's, let's go to Mr. Fritz so I can stick with him my five minutes. Uh, very briefly, Steve can comment uh, Congressman it. Ritter, uh, the FCC did not use the localism rationale in developing must-carry rules. And uh, the, the uh, courts, as I understand it, said that must-carry rules could be crafted. They would have to be done so carefully, but in fact, they could be crafted. Uh, beyond that, let me just say that any broadcaster who's not doing local news, public service, and public information does so uh, with some degree of jeopardy because they put their licenses at risk. They are licensed by the Federal Communications Commission to serve a specific area. And if they don't fulfill their public interest obligations, they then could lose those licenses. And as I understand it, the FCC just a couple of weeks ago uh, set four <coughs> licensees for hearing. Uh, because of, of, of a variety of issues. But nonetheless, uh, the Commission does put licenses at risk, and we are required by law, by law, to serve a specific area. Now, the problem is, and I'm certainly glad to hear my, my good friend Steve say that he would be glad to help craft another, another must-carry um, uh, rule and, and hopefully into law, as, as John Malone and, and Ted Turner agreed. The problem is that if in some markets you have 70 or 80 percent cable penetration. That means a broadcaster who has denied carriage on those systems cannot serve 70 to 80 percent of the audience which they were licensed to serve. It's certainly an anomaly in, in this day and time which has been outstripped as you well know by technology. Couldn't they with the AB switch though have a real well, The AB switch doesn't work. We all agree with that. I mean it's, it's uh, John Malone mentioned it earlier. Uh, uh, Jim Mooney has talked about it. It's just inefficient. It just doesn't work. It's not practical. 
Mr. Rifos? No, Mr. Ritter. Do you, uh, and you might, want, like might want to comment also whether or not, uh, whether or not you support the Bryant approach, and if, if not, why not? No, we do not support the Bryant approach. And as I said in, uh, before, we don't see any of the uh, legislation that has been suggested so far, far that would pass constitutional muster. And the reason is, CATA has been involved in the, in the First Amendment must-carry issue for over 11 years, fighting it in courts. And Eddie is simply wrong. The original rationale that the FCC used in the Quincy case was localism. And the court threw it out, saying there is no evidence of significant localism being protected. Indeed, if anything, the commission has been getting rid of its requirements for local programming, and therefore there is very little substance to this anymore at all. <coughs> Consequently, the second time they tried to uh, write the rules, they looked for some other rationale, realizing that the localism rationale wasn't going to work. The problem with the, the Bryant approach is that an unconstitutional condition is no less unconstitutional for being a condition. There is plenty of law that says that, look, if you can't tell the newspaper to write this column, you can't turn around, because it's unconstitutional, you can't then turn around and say, well, okay, we're going to let you park on the sidewalks from now on, but we're only going to let you park on the sidewalks for a fee, and the fee is that you write this column. That's in essence what's going on here. The court has said you have to have a public interest rationale that meets constitutional tests, the O'Brien test specifically, and possibly a tougher test, before the government can tell a medium what it must or must not carry. To try to duck that constitutional issue by going through a side door and saying, well, we're only doing it because we're creating a condition on the compulsory license, doesn't make it any less a test of constitutionality. And what I'm suggesting to you is that the way it is drafted right now, you would still wind up in that same constitutional test. We suggested over two years ago to the broadcast industry that if what Eddie says is correct, that the broadcasters want uh, continuity, they want to be able to go to their banker and say, yes, we do know we're going to be carried. We do know we're going to be carried on this channel. There is no fear of being taken off or shifted or so on. Let's have long-term, low-cost, lease-channel agreements with broadcasters. We were told, absolutely ridiculous. We want a government law that tells us we've got to be carried. So we went back. And here's another suggestion, if you don't like that one. Let's take the agreement that we've already reached which is already in place, which we are already enforcing in the cable industry, and allow, through an antitrust exemption, it to be codified in, uh, I hate to use the, the standard term, but an NAB type code, which the Justice Department today won't let us do, to have the agreement that we've already got and we're already doing enforceable. Those are ways to do it that I think would pass constitutional muster. I think the present bills that are extant would not pass constitutional muster. And even if we didn't oppose it, there are segments <coughs> of the cable industry that would oppose it simply because they have a very purist view of the First Amendment. We cannot stop that. So let's all look at the reality of the First Amendment issue and say, let's deal with it. Doing it drive by a side door doesn't deal with it. You're back, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Mr. Oxley, you have questions? I recognize you at this time for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, first of all, does everybody agree with Mr. Fritz that the AB switch is a non-issue? That it's, it's a non-starter? Uh, yeah, we certainly do. If you look in our written materials, as I said, you'll see an affidavit of a lady that lives in New York City, <coughs> right? I mean, there's got to be 30 grade B contour signals over her roof. But because she lives in a cooperative apartment building, just like an awful lot of other urban residents um, she, uh, that has cable, they let their master antenna system deteriorate. She can't get the building to put one back up. They say to her quite reasonably, if you want to watch television, just sign up for the cable like everybody else. And included in our written materials, you'll see pictures of what kind of a picture she gets when she takes an antenna with rabbit ears and puts it in the windowsill, <clears throat> leans the rabbit ears out the window. She cannot get a viewable picture on her television set unless she hooks it up to the cable. And there are millions of American people in that same situation. Remember, cable did quite well with growth before they had any program services of their own. 
the only reason why all of those millions of people could have subscribed to cable was they needed it to get television. Now, if you go to that kind of a consumer and say, here's an AB switch, and we're not putting some of the local stations on, what are they supposed to do with the switch? They don't have access to an antenna that they can hook it to. Mr. Efros? We yeah. would definitely disagree with that on two points. And it's very interesting if you follow the logic. The broadcast industry is saying oh, yeah, that wow. we have an invaluable asset, the broadcast license, which, by the way, is given yeah. to them for oh. free by the federal government. They have made millions and millions of dollars over a period of years without cable. Now they're saying that broadcasting doesn't work, that they have to have cable carriage because broadcasting doesn't work. The primary thing they point to in saying that broadcasting doesn't work is that portion of the American population that cannot get a good signal. There are several reasons for not getting a good signal. Either the broadcasters haven't put in a translator station to cover behind the mountain, which they could do if they wanted to spend the money to do it, or we are in the canyons of a city and we cannot get good reception in the city. That's probably true. But in those cases, I would invite this subcommittee to investigate <coughs> the proportion of cable-served cooperative apartment houses and uh, apartment buildings <coughs> versus SMA TV and non-cable-served such buildings. And you will find the preponderance are not cable-served. Indeed, as Bill was saying before, we're fighting to get access to those buildings. So they're fighting an issue saying we can't be seen in these apartment buildings, therefore you've got to do something to the cable industry, and it isn't the cable industry that's serving those apartment buildings in the first place. Amen. Let's give Mr. Fritz an inning here. I, I think that uh, Steve failed to answer the question about the AB switch. Uh, it just doesn't work. I think Dr. Malone, who operates uh, more cable systems in the country than anybody else, was very clear on that in the first panel. Well, what did this uh, lady do before cable, Preston? She had a, uh, th their building maintained a master antenna system, which they kept in repair before cable came along. In a lot of cases, when cable comes along, it, it takes over the internal wiring in the building that used to feed those master antenna systems. There's just a lot of people that don't have ac independent access, independent of the cable operator, uh, to television service, which is why they subscribe to cable in the first place. I mean, it's the development of the industry is such it's easy to lose sight of the fact, and I don't mean this in any pejorative way, the cable began as a technology to distribute to people who couldn't receive satisfactory broadcast service uh, the signals of the local broadcasters. Well, let me ask Mr. Fritz a uh, final question. The, uh, the comments that Mr. Efros brought out in regard to uh, long-term contractual relationship or lease relationship uh, in, in lieu of uh, government mandates. Uh, on the surface, uh, seems rather attractive, makes a good deal of sense, not only from your standpoint, in terms of the long-term uh, stability uh, with uh, your uh, uh, clients, but uh, the same uh, type of uh, advantage uh, on the cable system. What's wrong with, uh, with that system? Well, at the time we negotiated with the cable industry relative to um, new must carry agreement, which we approached the FCC with, uh, that was one of the, one of the uh, ideas that surfaced. There were a number of ideas that surfaced. It just happened to be a less attractive idea at the time than the ones that we came up with. Uh, just so the committee will know, uh, the NAB has commissioned um, a study by a renowned um, uh, constitutional law firm uh, and that study is underway now to determine the best way to sustain constitutionality of a new must carry rule. Uh, well, as I understand, if I could break in, as I understand it, we're talking about a relatively informal uh, series of agreements uh, that would not be dictated by law, therefore would not, as I understand it, uh, be uh, subject to a challenge uh, by uh, by constitutional lawyers or others uh, regarding First Amendment uh, freedoms. Isn't that right, Mr. Efros? Absolutely. It would be private contractual agreements. If I could respond to that, I think if you ask the cable industry if they would be willing to accept voluntary agreements by the broadcasters to give them the rights to retransmit their signals as opposed to having the government step in and give them a compulsory copyright license, you might find their enthusiasm for voluntary agreements would evaporate right before your eyes. 
Well, uh, I was specifically, of course, addressing the question of must carry and how we deal with that. And if we are, if we can't find a good enough lawyers and all of the high-paid lawyers that you folks uh, uh, hire, they're probably sitting out here somewhere, um, very expensively, I might add. Uh, if they can't come up with a with a uh, with an approach to must carry that's going to pass the constitutional muster, then it seems to me that uh, we're going to have to find some other way to uh, to get around that problem and to solve that problem. And that that solves your problem, solves your problem, and it certainly solves your problem. Hopefully, except that it's not clear um, to which broadcast stations the cable operator under that scenario would offer uh, to enter into an agreement with. I mean, it, it be, in, it's a solution that begs the question. I mean, it leaves them with a government-guaranteed right they're going to be able to take any broadcast signal they want without needing to worry about the permission of the broadcaster, but leaves them in a position to select which broadcast stations they're going to offer these agreements to. It's really, it's, it's a non-solution. I would simply point right. out, sir, that that is exactly the solution that was accepted by the broadcast industry and attempted to be codified by the FCC rules that they're completely <coughs> missing, because under those rules, we had that same right. I've exhausted my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired, and we have a minor problem here in that we have a vote on, and from the time it initially indicated a vote. Tom, do you have questions you want to ask? Do we want to come back? I do, but I don't want to. We'll have Congressman Eckert. I didn't see Congressman Eckert down here. I guess uh, we'll just, well, we will, uh, <coughs> I think we'll be back in 10 minutes. Stand at ease. Okay. That's right. Okay, we'll uh, come back to order now. The other members of uh, the committee are younger guys and not as quick a step as the old chairman, so they'll be on in a little bit. We'll recognize them. In the meantime, uh, I'll yield myself a few questions, a few moments. Uh, Dr. Malone suggested in his prepared testimony, and that's on the earlier group, that uh, TCI would welcome telephone company participation in the cable business so long as RBOCs and other telephone companies are prohibited from offering cable service in their own service areas. Uh, start with you, Mr. Efros. Do you agree to that? Well, not only do I agree, sir. Is that an acceptable uh, resolution of the cable? Well, it already exists, sir. Telco issue. It already exists. With the exception of the RBOCs, telephone companies nationwide are able today to get into the cable business anytime they want, so long as it's not in their own service area. The, uh, the other thing that I think should be clarified for the record for, uh, with regard to Mr. Swift's question was that a telephone company today in its own service area operating as a common carrier could provide video service. Uh, what are the dangers involved? The, the primary danger involved is when you take an RBOC, a very large corporation, where you cannot truly control and understand even the economics uh, of, the, of the business, and attempt to say, you may get into a business, but you may not cross-subsidize. Uh, the FCC was never able to figure out AT&T's rates when, when the Bell system was a single entity. Uh, the, the FCC was more than willing to acknowledge on occasion that it could not control or figure out the rate structures. Uh, and what we're afraid of is that the same thing would be true on cross-subsidization in cable television provision by an RBOC. But other than that, if telephone companies want to go into other service areas and offer cable television service, they're doing it today. The Centel Corporation is, is a large telephone independent telephone uh, company that has major cable holdings nationwide. But they can lease premises. Excuse me? They can't offer video services uh, of their own, on their own system? On a leaseback basis, yeah. they can. Uh, absolutely. That's what, a, that's what they do. No, no. In, in Centel's case, Centel goes outside of its own service area and buys franchises. It offers Centel is a very large independent telephone company, and it is also a very large independent multiple system cable operator. 
what they have done is gotten into the business, but not the two businesses in the same area. Just as cable television is not allowed or television is not allowed to be in the same area together, the same owner in the same area, all we're suggesting is telephone should be treated the same way. If, if you're going to have television cross ownership rules in cable television, or and now there's some suggestion at times of newspaper cross ownership rules in cable television, those are for one policy reason. We're suggesting another policy reason in terms of economics, a cross ownership rule in terms of telephone in its own well, service. So long as the companies are prohibited from offering cable services in their own area, and any you accept, you, you think that's an acceptable? Yeah, any other, any other telephone entry into the cable business Who disagrees fine. with that? We'd love to, by the way, get into their business as well. We're Patton, prohibited. People anybody on this panel disagree with that? Uh, Mr. Fritz? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we're, we're, we're still doing an analysis on that. We have, um, up until this point, filed, uh, uh, as I understand it, the Federal Communications Commission um, against um, uh, telco ownership or involvement in... What's their next move, logically? What is the phone company's next yeah. move? Uh, I think uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a seer by any stretch of the imagination, but... I think they want very badly to get into this to this industry, uh, and and obviously the reason the cable industry says you can't do it in your in your own service area, uh, it makes it very unattractive for them to want to do it at all. Uh, the fact that they would have wires running to every home in their service area would make it very attractive to them if they were precluded from doing it within their service area. Obviously, uh, takes away a great incentive. Mayor Strange, well, what makes it tough is the fact that there would be a different playing field. They'd have different rules. But I think that the telephone company is going to be right on top of you all before very long and seeing what they can do. Now, very long, maybe one, two, three years. Dr. Malone seems to be well on his way to having the market cornered. Uh, what, uh, what effect would uh, the telephone entry into the market have? Uh, Mr. Padden, you... Yeah, I'd just like to comment on this a little bit. You know, there's a rule right now that uh, at the FCC that keeps the telephone companies out. And the reason, one of the reasons anyway, is and quoted in our written testimony, is the fear that uh, a monopoly telephone company would use its facilities to favor affiliated interests. And yet when our stations confront... Keep everybody out and off. Yeah, when our stations confront what's going on on a lot of vertically integrated cable systems today, we find, for example, ourselves shifted out of favorable channel positions in favor of an, of an interest, a program service that's affiliated with the cable operator. So I think we're seeing in the vertically integrated cable industry a lot of the, the same problems that were the reason the telephone companies were kept out of uh, cable to begin with. Broadcasters, similarly, are not allowed to own the cable system in town on, the, again, quoted in our written testimony on the quite reasonable fear that they might use their control of the cable system to favor their own TV station and, and disfavor the others. Well, that's exactly what we're seeing happen with vertically integrated cable systems. And, and if you listen to our arguments about our fears of their monopoly and their anti-competitive practices and listen to the cable industry's fears about the telephone companies and their monopoly facilities and their anti-competitive practices, there's an awful lot of parallel there. No, it's very different, sir, if I may. We have a difference of opinion. There, well, there, this, is, this is an extremely complex issue, and I don't, I don't... You have to follow the bouncing ball for a minute. The problem with telephone entry into the cable business in its own service area is, as Bill said, the, cable, the telephone industry is interested in getting into the cable business as an ancillary service in its own service area. It's simply one more thing that the wire can do. And it would like to make an incremental income from that. What we have learned, if anything, in the cable business is that in order to provide diversity to the public, you have to be able to be willing to pay for programming. You have to be willing to promote that programming. Indeed, since nobody else was willing to do it, you have to be willing to create the programming yourself. Now, we're getting criticized for that today. That's what Mr. Malone was criticized for this morning. But indeed, if you l heard Mr. Baruch's testimony, what he was saying is, hey, when the programmers were out there looking for financing, the movie companies didn't come along and give them financing. The broadcasters didn't come along and give them financing. 
Indeed, the only financing they could find was the cable industry because the cable industry had an interest <coughs> in promoting that cable. And the reason it was promoting the cable is because it could get revenue streams on both sides. It could get revenue streams from providing the cable service and from providing programming to the home and eventually advertising and so on. The telephone company does not have that incentive. As a result, if you allow telephone companies in their own areas to get into the cable business, it is likely that they would have no incentive to create the diversity. They don't make any money from that. The only way they would make money is if they could sell the, the line to somebody else. They want to have an incremental income. The net result, we fear, would be a loss to the public. And that has to be investigated extremely carefully before we have any of these miracle cures that are sometimes suggested that the telephone industry would solve the competitive impact problem in cable television. How about if you could use their poles, their fiber optics, what would be your we attitude? We can today. There? We what could lease could? back the system today. There's, you don't need any mm -hmm. law change today to do that. Well, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Fritz. If I could hit you on that just for a second. Some of our people have had discussions uh, and have heard phone company estimates which say that um, in the ensuing years they expect uh, as much as 60 to 70 percent of their revenues to be generated along these lines of providing program services. Uh, and I think that's fairly significant. And clearly uh, the role of this subcommittee uh, on the leading edge of telecommunications policy I think is to make sure that there's a, a balanced equation or an equilibrium, if you will, for all players in this competitive marketplace. Amen. And uh, I, I don't think we are far away from agreeing with our friends in the cable industry uh, that there are really three issues that, that we as broadcasters would like to come together with the cable industry on, and those are must carry, channel shifting, which I think we've seen some uh, discussions which might lead to some agreements, uh, hopefully so, and then the issue of uh, syndicated exclusivity. And obviously, Cable says uh, we want syndicated product uh, to be exclusive to us, and, and we would like, in turn, for, it, for that which we bargain and pay for to be exclusive to us as well. So I think in terms of public policy issues, as far as the, uh, we in the broadcast industry are concerned, that we, uh, we have those three issues that if we could resolve uh, with the assistance and guidance uh, from the subcommittee, uh, then I believe uh, we could uh, lay a lot of issues to rest that have been thorns in the sides of all of us. I think it's obvious that uh, we have in this panel, and we had in the panel this morning with Ted Turner and Jack Valenti, Ralph Baruch, and John Malone, and this group here, probably the most knowledgeable, as knowledgeable a group of people as you could ever accumulate in one area, from the smallest uh, type operation that Bill Strange runs in my hometown, that I want to ask him some questions about in a little bit, and to right on up to uh, John Malone, who <laughs> I'm told, well, if bad women, bad whiskey, or bad horses or something doesn't intervene, go on all of us. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I say that from an admiring standpoint. <laughs> 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 or bad legislation. You know. <laughs> but uh, yesterday we were working on product liability and tort reform, and the, the bottom line there was how do we get our insurance premiums at a reasonable rate. Well, here we're working on uh, increasing the viewer consumer choices in the video marketplace. That's the product that we're looking for here. Uh, how are we going to do that? Uh, not with all of you fighting one another. Uh, it's uh, obvious that, uh, and also in, in his prepared testimony, Dr. Malone, uh, the big one, even call for a truce, as, as I read his testimony. Uh, a subcommittee sanctioned truce is the way he put it. Uh, in the war of words uh, between the industries, in the summit between the leaders of the affected industries and a moratorium on legislative and regulatory activity this year. And Mr. Ifros tells me that the laws as it is is the way they're operating and that it'd take a change. Uh, obviously, he'd want a moratorium on legislation. What do we really need that will bring us, as viewers and consumers, uh, the best choices at a fair figure in the marketplace? What, you, you're here, you you've, you've are successful people or we wouldn't have invited you. You're knowledgeable or you wouldn't have come. 
Let me speak to that, Mr. Chairman. I think if the cable television industry ever gets away from focusing on the quality of both the programming and the service that they give to the consumer, they got a real problem. And by the same token, Mr. Payton has a problem if we can't sit down together and get it done. He's got a good example, and I want to take one minute and read this to you because this is an editorial. At an independent station called KDNL, it's carried on 112 cable systems in or near St. Louis. Only four or five operators refuse to carry the signal, and they're more than 100 miles away. They preach the benefits, get this. Like a fellow once said, come let us reason together. You know, buddy of yours from the Pertinatus. Says, in January... We need him right now. Yes, sir. Establish one-to-one -one relationship between the station personnel and cable officials. Innovative cable previews on the station prove mutually beneficial. In January, six area cable systems bought two nights of advertising on KDNL to showcase the cable wares. They say the operators received 4,000 phone inquiries converted 1,049 into new subscribers. Those same operators have now bought a tremendous schedule on the station to promote the National Cable Mart. All you got to do is try to get along. You get a whole lot more flies with sugar than you do vinegar, don't you? If you're hunting flies. I believe you're pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I believe some of you people are super salesmen too, though. <laughs> with those folks that you get on the other end of that line. Well, uh, I, 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 I'd like to respond. I know to that. you heard the story about the policeman that pulled a guy off a of Golden Gate Bridge, said, You can't jump off this bridge. And he said, I can't. He was a super salesman, said, Listen to me. And he listened to him for five minutes. They then shook hands, and both of them both jumped off jumped. the bridge. <laughs> No, I think you do a tremendous service. I, I know of the success that you've had in the small area, and I know that you've had other successes of, in other uh, operations, but, uh, uh, and I'd guess you'd handle a consumer complaint at the lowest, smallest level, just like you would in, with the lady that had the problems in New York City, by being responsive. You're hurt if you don't. And uh, how do you handle consuming customers request for stations that you aren't carrying for example uh, there uh, in, in my hometown well we got a, a religious channel that I don't particularly care for don't like don't want to carry you put them back on I never took them off we had three or four women call us and tell us please don't take our channel off air we're going to listen to the consumer. You don't, you're not going to have them very long. There may be your voters, but there are customers. And if you're a businessman, you take care of your customers. What you all are hearing is a bunch of mishmash between entities, between interests. Listen to the consumer. Whenever they start not getting satisfied, they give hell to the cities. And the cities give us hell. And you gave me hell. Because I took a radar channel off and ain't nobody looking at it, I didn't think, but there were. <laughs> <laughs> if there weren't many of them, they sounded like a lot, didn't they? Mr. Patton, you've been flouncing around again. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's only a certain amount of this you can take yeah, and right. sit still. Okay. Uh, we, of course, believe that local stations and cable operators ought to work together in a spirit of goodwill. We have always believed that. Good. The problem that we have uh, today is that despite the best efforts, and in a lot of our written material that we've been uh, provided to the subcommittee with the letters from our members, they describe they have done everything but um, they have worked very hard to work with their local cable operators. Uh, and they still, in some cases, have taken it on the chin. Now, there's no way Mr. Strange can tell me that consumers are being served when a local station with a wide following is yanked out of a low channel number that gets through to every consumer, booted up to Cable Siberia, and replaced with some program service in which the cable operator has an equity interest and in which he's selling advertising and which gets a mere fraction of the audience 
of the local station. He can't tell me that's in the interest of consumers. It's not in the interest of consumers. He might and this can. summer in New York City, working men and women are going to have to pay to see 60 Yankee games that Channel 11 is ready, willing, and able to show them for free. And I'm telling you, that does not serve consumers' interest. Now, they're willing to pay for the cable program services they buy. They pay for ESPN, they pay for MTV, they pay for everything else except our product. And 70 to 80 percent of the viewing on their cable system is to our product. And if they're not willing to be subject to an obligation to treat us fairly, it seems to me the only solution is to take away their free ride on our programming. Can we just correct records here before they get out of hand? I think we that's a nicer way of saying it than, uh, than Mr. Turner did this morning. He said that, that uh, Valenti spoke with forked tongue. So you, you just well, want to correct the record, don't yes, you? Yes, I, I, I do. I, I spent 48 hours trying to go through the pound and a half document to, to find something that was accurate in it. And, and unfortunately, Preston's presentation just now reflects the same attitude on accuracy. The cable industry pays for that product. I, I, it, it is remarkable to me that broadcast, some broadcasters, Eddie didn't say this, are still sitting in front of congressional committees saying that cable operators Eddie don't might. pay for product. Hmm? I, it's, it's just incredible. We do pay for the product, number one. Number two, this is, I mean, I don't want to get into a spitting match with the broadcast industry. This is ridiculous. We are carrying, I'll bring it out again. There it is. This is what we're talking about. 1,349 television stations on the air. Preston, after sending a plea around the country for horror stories, managed to come up with 42 of them. Of those, 12 had to do with carriage. We are talking about less than one half of one percent of the broadcast industry, and we're spending an awful lot of your time. Our Lord missed on one out of twelve. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, he, and that one out of twelve is about the only one most people can name. <laughs> Got him in a lot of trouble, too. <laughs> okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Brugger, you've been... Just on the, the unbelievably statistics. quiet over there. <laughs> Usually, and even not even flouncing. <laughs> uh, that's because we serve in the public interest, and there's a substantial government interest to carry us. So we're not uh, in the big money side of this business. But in terms of the kind of statistics that you're being shown, uh, as of May 9th, we have 94 instances of cable systems that have dropped public TV stations, and the service hasn't been restored. We've had more than that, but a lot of them have been restored. We have 127 instances of channel shifting. That number shifts all the time because it's happening all the time. I mean, I just have a letter this week from uh, one up in Wisconsin where the school system has lost its service because the cable system channel shifted uh, the programming of the Wisconsin State Network. It is one of those things we're working on, one of the things we want to work on. I guess what I'm always surprised about when I listen to people talk about serving the public interest, even on the cable side, is that so many cable operators at the local level seem to be out of touch with many of the people in their community. And we only hear about and get complaints about it when that community starts complaining because the cable operator has dropped the service. Mr. Chairman, I would like, Mr. if Strange. the record, are those public broadcasting systems on cable systems that now do not have any public broadcasting systems, or were there two there? No, there's, there are different services. That <coughs> we don't have necessarily each channel duplicating the programming. Matter of fact, we did a study in uh, Washington, San Francisco, and New York uh, last year, and uh, found out that only that 80 percent of the programming was unduplicated no, on really the public my question stations. question is, I can't conceive of a cable system not carrying PBS. Mm -hmm. They're crazy if they don't. I just can't mm -hmm. believe that there isn't some PBS broadcasting on a cable mm -hmm. system. It's not just that whether they're carrying them or not. It's when they constantly shift the channel. When a school system isn't able to get it because they've shifted the channel, because they don't have cable tuners or converters on all of their systems no, I in the schools. we took it off. 
There have been 94 instances of drops, that's right. But the cable systems do not have PBS station on it. I can't believe that. that. Mr. If you Chairman, can't, I, if you I, can't I, believe I, it, do you believe it? No, sir. I uh, sure don't. Mr. Fritz, do you believe it? <laughs> 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 They're both my friends. Yeah. <laughs> I would say this: well, that if every cable operator operated uh, as Mr. Strange operates, I think that um, there would be a few, if any, problems uh, in our industry. Uh, obviously, he's a man who's sensitive to his local community. He's in touch with it. He lives there. He's a part of it. And he's a very meaningful uh, uh, person in that uh, cable industry. I uh, was just chatting with him. Uh, I grew up with cable and, and subscribed to it ever since I, I had television, I guess. And so I've had experiences with some various systems, some good, some bad. Uh, and, and, and that's probably the way with broadcast stations, in all fairness. But I would say that if everyone operated the way Mr. Strange does, I don't think any of us would have any significant problems. But it's clear that when the constituents in his hometown had to write you, for you to write him, that there uh, obviously uh, is some unrest uh, from time to time in the cable industry. And I, can, and I can appreciate that. And I think what we're trying to do as broadcasters and cable operators is trying to come together uh, with the sanction of this subcommittee and uh, put together uh, something that we can, we can uh, lock arms and go forward with and el eliminate, uh, hopefully, a lot of your problems, but we will need your help. Now, they ask for a moratorium, and a moratorium means no legislation, and that means don't do anything. Uh, let's all, after this hearing, turn around, go home, and continue with our regular business. I can't quite go that far, Mr. Chairman. I, w I would hope that uh, at least uh, significant proposals would rise in this session of Congress. I thank, uh, I thank you, Mr. Fritz. And uh, we're nearing the ending of this hearing. Uh, I know that with the smoothness of the operation that Mr. Strange has spoken of and that he has no problems or anything that we as we folk, folks that are, put, that are customers of his can look to maybe a cut in the rates there sometime in the near well, future. Mr. Chairman, <laughs> you don't okay. quit preaching on the meddling. <laughs> All right. Let's let me ask one question. What, what uh, the FCC defines effective competition in a given market as three or more receivable over the air broadcast signals. Is, is that a fair way to, to determine uh, what effective competition is? You think that a consumer's ability to receive three or more over the air broadcast stations constitutes adequate competition to a cable system? Is that a, is that a fair? How about you, Mr. Afros? I think you have to look at the context. The context of the question of effective competition with regard to the FCC issue has to do with rate regulation. And the question there is, at what point does the market affect the ability of any provider of services in such a way that he or she cannot abuse their rate structure? In other words, charge a monopoly price. The cable industry now has studies for over a year now done by three different independent groups that indicate that cable rates have not gone up more than 6 to 7 percent, which is very well within the cost of living indexes and everything else. So apparently, we would have to say that the Commission is correct. In one way or another, the market has affected the cable system's ability to, to increase its rates in such a way that those rates are not out of line with other rates in the economy. Again, I, I, you, you gave me the ideal reason to pick up another one of these. Uh, we have 21,579 cable communities in the United States. In the other body last month, we were challenged on rate regulation. They were able to come up with 93 alleged unreasonable rate increases. And those 93 were simply statistically any rate that looked like it had jumped higher than normal. That doesn't take into account the fact that the 84 Act specifically looked at rate deregulation of rates for the reason that regulators were using rate regulation for other purposes and therefore some cable rates were artificially low. Naturally, you can expect rates to increase if they were artificially low. But the point is, out of 21,579 communities, Senator Metzenbaum, and it wasn't this committee, but Senator Metzenbaum raised 
93 alleged unreasonable rate increases. So you can see the statistics do not support any indication that we're abusing our power and the FCC's reason for establishing an effective competition standard was to make sure that we were not abusing our rates. They must have done something right. Mr. Chairman, um, I, I, rate regulation is not really our issue, but just so everything accords with the facts. Uh, the League of Cities has done a survey which shows that the rates have increased about 24 or 27 percent. Uh, I call your attention to a couple of articles which appeared in the Fairfax Journal surveying cable companies in this area. Um, and, and where one of them, one of the uh, managers said, we raised rates, number one, because we could, and number two, because we needed to. Uh, rates are not a big issue with broadcasters. Carriage is the issue with us. And, and, uh, but I, I, I have a feeling rates are somewhat sensitive to you and your colleagues. We have a parting salvo, Mr. Patton. Sure. Uh, in our <laughs> written, written presentation, you'll find an economist paper that points out uh, in a cold academic fashion why three over-the-air signals does not provide effective competition to cable. I think people of common, ordinary common sense know that three over-the-air signals is not effective competition for a broad range of diversified video services. You know that what the basic cable animal has changed rather dramatically since when Congress passed the 1984 Act. And if there really was effective competition out there, I don't think you'd see everybody who's trying to get through that pipeline coughing up 49% of their equity to get through. I think that's a pretty sure sign that we don't have effective competition. As president of the National Association of Public Television Stations, do you have a closing remark, Mr. Brugger? Uh, just to say that regardless of the technology, we think that American taxpayers have a right to access to their programming and all the stations that are broadcasting, whether it's into the schools or into the homes. And we hope that whatever happens, this government will always assure that they have access to that programming. For the other members of the committee who didn't make it back, who may have questions to submit to you, we would ask you to respond to them. And we will, unless there's objection, make them a part of this record. We do thank you for your very generous uh, gift of your time and your knowledge and, and uh, all your exhibits and, and everything. <laughs> we invite you back at any time. Thank you again. Thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. If you'd like more information on this hearing on cable television programming diversity, you can write to the House Energy and Commerce Telecommunications Subcommittee in room 316 of House Annex No. 2, Washington, D.C., 20515.